Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. Here is a little bit of background. I was 20 at the time. I moved in with my uncle in San Antonio, Texas with the agreement that I didn't have to pay rent as long as I helped him out with chores and my cousins. I got a job at a super known coffee chain downtown close to the Turksy part of the area. We had a lot of regulars and a lot of homeless coming in and out. I felt relatively safe though because I got to know the people there and it was almost always a lot of foot traffic. I used to even take walks after work in the area, especially since I was super close to the river walk. Skipped to a couple of months into the job and I was friends with everyone I worked with. We were all super close. On this particular day, it was one of my co-workers last day. There was about three guys who had been in there almost all morning. They hadn't bought anything and were just hanging out which was not unusual for my location. On my break I decided to walk down to a nearby drugstore so I can get a farewells card and maybe a small gift for said coworker. I walked out and put my earphones in and before I could press play I hear the door open behind me and footsteps following behind. Whoever it was caught up to me and started walking beside me matching my pace exactly. I turned to look and it was one of the guys that had been there all morning. He was a bit taller than me. He tried to ask for my number and I kindly told him no. He persisted and I with a short temper told him to screw off. He stopped and stared at me in surprise. He stood there as I walked away and by the time I went back they were gone. I proceeded to tell my coworkers about the encounter and we laughed it off. I thought that would be the end of it. I was wrong. Every shift after that he would already be there just hanging out or would walk in mid shift. Sometimes with somebody else and sometimes by himself. I assumed he was just another homeless person because how else was he always able to be around? My shifts were sporadic. Some days I opened, some days I closed, some days I worked mid but it didn't matter he was always there. At that point I started feeling paranoid. I would always catch him staring in my direction. He never ordered anything, never talked to me, and luckily wouldn't follow me. He would just sit there, watching me. I started mentioning it to my coworkers and they started noticing it too. One of my team leaders would help me out by sending me to wash dishes in the back or organize the cooler. My coworkers would also try and place themselves to try and block me from his view. I started feeling uncomfortable at work. Sometimes when I closed a coworker would walk me to my car before heading home themselves. Or if I didn't close they would walk me to my car and turn around and head back to work. Then one day of him just staring, I was working the register that day. He walked up and ordered a water. I asked for his name for his order. I now had his first name just in case. He took his water and sat down. I had mentioned him before to my manager, but because he hadn't really done anything, we couldn't do anything beside note it in the manager book. The next day I worked with my manager. It was him, two of the co-workers, and me. I told them I had to go to the bathroom real quick. There were two bathrooms right next to each other, but sort of hidden from the coffee bar and register and they weren't gender specific. I walked around the bar to the lobby area, I had to pass this table and walk down the lobby to get to the bathrooms. I noticed him get up before going inside the bathroom. I sat down to do my business when someone rattled the knob. I shouted out that it was occupied, but whoever it was kept rattling the door until I finished. When I opened the door, no one was there, and walking back I noticed him adjusting back into his chair. I was super freaked out and told my boss. He couldn't tell him anything because we had no proof that it was him. Later that shift he got up and picked up a coffee from the pickup area. My boss assumed that he had ordered it and let him take it. I told him it wasn't and that it wasn't even his name. My boss used this as an opportunity to tell him if he does something like that he can't come back. The man apologized and actually stuck to the rules every day after that. He went back to just watching me. Cut to Valentine's Day. One of my team leaders and I would be scheduled to work certain Thursdays after close to deep clean the store. We would stay until 1am. This was one of those Thursdays. We were almost done and I had to clean the bathrooms as one of the last chores. I finished and as I walk out the bathroom I see him peeking in with both his hands, pressed to the window eyes wide just staring at me with this super intense look. I froze for a second just staring back. I notice on one of his palms that is pressed to the window, a purple foam heart. He doesn't move at all. I freak out and run back into the bathroom. I shout, Hannah Hannah, he's here, he's back. She barely hears me through the music we were blasting. Hannah was the team lead who would help me hide me from him so she knew the huge fear I had towards him. She walks towards the bathroom shouting back, what are you saying? What's going on? As soon as she gets close she sees him. I told her again, he's here, he's watching me. She started shouting through the window, you need to leave, if you don't leave we're calling the police. I step out a little to see if he'll leave and he's ignoring her and his eyes were fixated in my direction. I step back into the bathroom and my lead continues to shout at him to leave and threatens him with the police. 
About 5 minutes pass and he realizes that I'm not stepping out until he leaves, so he does. The next day my lead and I told my manager I want to file a police report and he tells me to wait until he talks to his boss. He shows up again that day and I was only there to talk to my manager and leave right after. When I got home, a friend convinced me to call the cops. So I text my boss that I don't care what he or his boss says, I'm scared and I'm going to file that report. I dial 911 and tell them a summarized version. They tell me they're going to send someone to where I live to take the official report. The two officers were nice and supportive. I told them my whole story and how my boss didn't feel the need to get cops involved since I wasn't harmed. The officers told me that I should have called right away and defend me saying they could get him for harassment. I thank them and they tell me that if he shows up to dial 911 so they can take him in for trespassing and harassing. I think that day my manager banned him and warned him because he never showed up to the coffee shop again. A few months later when I was comfortable again with downtown, I went out with some friends to walk around. We were close to where I worked at and as we round a corner I see him and so I ducked into a little corner store and my friends follow. I told them I saw him and they kept an eye out. Once he was out of view we left the store and that was the last time I saw him. I just hope that he never comes back. I'm in a school still and work for my family member on certain weekends at a local college selling concessions at the stadium. It's about once twice a month and the stadium is off towards the edge of town. It's Friday night and I just gotten out of school and I had to go straight to work. I get to work, work for 4 hours, half shift tonight, and my boss, my aunt, tells me we need more spoons for tomorrow's event. We sell ice cream, and these events have like 5,000 plus people at them. I say okay, and I'll go grab them on my way home. The only store open with heavy duty spoons is all the way on the other side of town, and I still wanted to go meet up with some of my friends and mess around. I decide to take the faster but more sketchy way around the outskirts of town. I live in a weather bipolar state. It snowed last night but I figured the roads would be fine enough even if they weren't plowed. I take off to the store and the first 5 minutes go by and nothing's wrong. I haven't seen a single car or any buildings the entire time. But keep in mind it's approaching 9pm and I'm on the outskirts of town and no one really takes this way in case they really have to. All of a sudden I see something in the corner of my eye and it looks like a man, roughly 5 foot 8 I'd say, wearing shorts, t-shirt and a backwards hat. He's in the ditch, walking in snow when it's 10 degrees out. My first thought is to pull over, but I'm on the phone with my mom at the time and she warns me not to as some things have happened before in this town. I consider stopping, but for some reason I tell myself not to. I wasn't really worried about anything. I pass the man, going about 40 miles per hour. Like I said, roads aren't the best. I drive not even 500 feet past him and immediately, a car that I did not see at all before turns on and pulls out of a field entrance off the road and starts to follow me. At first I thought I just was focused on the man in the ditch and didn't see a road and that's where they come from, but I later found out there was not a road there. I start to approach the town again and have to take some turns to get to where I'm going. I turn left, the car turns left. I turn right, the car turns right. I go around a roundabout and skip my turn and go twice as no one else was there, car follows. At this point I start to worry a little, but maybe they just need to go to the store also. I then pull up to a stop sign and I turn without my turn signal. The car follows. Now at this point I should have went straight to the police station, but I still didn't think much of it. I'm 2 miles from the store, where plenty of people will be. I take a few more turns and the car continues to follow me. I completely blew a stop sign at a non-busy intersection and the car does a quick stop and go and catches up. At this point, I have 2 turns till the store so I'm still not worried. I turn into the store and the car turns also. The store also has a gas station, so I pull there first to act like I was getting gas. The car sets off to the side of the road, in between gas station and store, and just sits there. I wait about 10 minutes and the car doesn't move. At this point, I start to get worried. I call my friends I'm supposed to meet up with later on and give them the license plate for worst case scenario, then take off to the store. I cross the street and the car comes straight behind me. I'm freaking out on the phone, not knowing if I should call the cops or not. I go and park as close as possible to the store, and the car parks three rolls behind me and a couple down. It's getting late at this point and the store is closing soon, there's only a couple others in the lot. I turn my truck back on and go park on the complete opposite side of the lot, get out and I completely bolt inside the store. I get spoons and take my time in the store. I go to call my friends to walk back outside and my phone is dead. I look out the sliding doors and suddenly there's a white van next to my driver's side. Looks like no one's in it but the back windows are covered and it's running. I run to customer service and explain everything, but they think I'm some young kid messing around. At that time I didn't see the original follow car, but no way I'm going outside with that van next to my truck. After waiting for about 30 minutes, the van pulls forward, and the original car appears from the side of the building. I wait another 10 minutes and dash outside. I speed to my friend's house, 
and when I get there I park in his garage. My one buddy asked why there's a big orange mark on my tire, and my heart sinks. When I was inside, the follow car must have marked my tire. After inspecting the rest of my truck, we find a small pipe dropped in the bed of my truck surrounded by snow. It was wrapped in duct tape. It was not mine. I was alone, no phone, scared, in a part of town I'm not familiar with. I can't help but think what would have happened if I walked outside. Last December, I was visiting my family down in Florida and we spent some time in Treasure Island. My brother and I took my dog down to the beach at about 2am to play some fetch and drink and have a good time. If you walk along the water, you can reach a few restaurants and bars and hotels that line the beach. Out of nowhere, we see someone walking pretty quickly in our direction from over there and a few minutes later, we can make out that they're being followed. My dog is arguably pretty well trained, we work search and rescue, and I've never once had her run off without permission and never once has she not instantly returned when called, but that changed that night. She was about 5 feet from me and I saw her hackle shoot up and I went to grab her collar, but she took off in a full sprint, making some truly terrifying barking and growling sounds. We obviously took off after her and she reached the first person and stopped between them and the people behind them. She was barking and growling and lunging and I finally caught up and put her on a leash. She's never reacted in that manner so it was scary. The group following her ended up being three men that were probably in their early 30s. They started booking it in the other direction. I turned around and the person being followed was a young woman around my age. We asked if she was okay and she just broke down in tears and collapsed into my brother. So she got into her phone and rang her friend's number to have us talk to her. We were able to figure out where she was staying and walk her back to her hotel where we met up with her friends and we all exchanged numbers to talk a later time. The next day we all got together where we learned she had gone out for a walk on the beach, stopped for a drink at the bar, drank a bit, and then just wasn't feeling right. So she left the bar and soon noticed three men left after her. She had been walking for about a mile at that point, terrified and slowly getting more and more screwed up. She doesn't remember much about that night and we knew she was probably on something, but we had no clue she'd been drugged. We're still friends now and we're all going to meet up for spring break when we're all back in Florida. I've never been more proud of my dog and more grateful that we were in the right place at the right time. I hate thinking about what could have happened. I'm an extremely outdoorsy female and love to spend a lot of time in nature. I spent the better part of my early 20s living in remote northern locations and exploring a lot of Alaska, Yukon, and British Columbia. I have many odd, frightening, and bizarre stories that came up from my time in the north and this is one of them. In the summer of 2012 when I was 22, I'm 26 now, I was living and working in a pretty remote town in northern British Columbia from May to September. The place I worked at was a campground in the provincial part of the Alaskan Highway, 4 hours north of Fort Nelson and 2 hours south of the Yukon-British Columbia border. The best part about this park was the fact that it had beautiful natural hot springs, which attracts tourists from all over North America every summer. I lived in an old trailer on a separate part of the campground where the rest of the staff lived. I quickly got used to living in a place where I had no running water, no electricity, no cell phone service, and no internet, and driving 4 hours to Fort Nelson every 2 weeks to get groceries and do my laundry. Life was pretty sweet. I got to hike, go for late night dips at the springs, make some traveling friends, and spend quality time in nature getting to know the flora and fauna of the landscape. My job at the campground was being a park facility operator, gatehouse attendant, wildlife interpreter, and sometimes had a few security shifts here and there. The feeling of living in the woods was much different than the feeling of living in a city, as far as safety goes. In the city I'm from, there are people around. You're aware of the fact that your house or apartment could get broken into, but emergency services are quick to respond and neighbors are also a plus. However, in the woods, I felt more vulnerable. The closest police were four hours away and I lived in a trailer that was run down enough that it could easily get broken into. Plus, it was pretty dark and anyone could sneak around easily at night. One night, at probably around two in the morning, I'm asleep inside my trailer and I'm awoken up to a very loud banging on my trailer door. Reasonably shaken, I look outside the window next to my bed and see a car with its lights on and two men standing at my door. I can feel the blood drain from my face. Through the door I say how can I help you and one of the guys, clearly hammered out of his mind, starts rambling on about something. No matter how hard I try, I cannot understand what he is saying. I say sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me, and the other guy starts frantically trying to explain something in the same drunken state as the first guy. I decide at this point that they don't mean any harm and I open the door to talk to them. They look visibly shaken and I can tell they are desperate for my help but don't have the mental capacity of a person sober enough to coherently tell me what's wrong. One of the dudes starts telling me a very long story that I managed to piece together through all of his slurring and hiccuping. Basically he says that him and his friend are on vacation, came up from Fort Nelson to party, they had a really long drive, were at the hot springs, 
they were having beers, and they were sorry about having beers. And then he drops the bomb that somebody's running around the campground, stabbing people. I look at the guy telling me the story and notice he has blood all over his clothing. I say, someone is going around stabbing people? And he replies, yes, someone's running around stabbing everybody. Then the other guy yells, come on, let's go, and they hop into the aforementioned car and speed off before I can question them any further. Now I'm standing at my trailer door, in the darkness, alone, thinking there's a maniac running around wielding a knife. I have no phone and I know that the only person who has a phone is the ranger, and his cabin is about a 5 minute walk away from my trailer. I remember that I have a radio so I run inside my trailer, lock the door, and try to get the ranger on the radio. His radio is off of course. The only thing I can do at this point is go to the ranger's cabin and notify him of the situation. I get to the ranger's cabin and pound on his door. He answers within a few minutes, visibly sleep deprived. And I tell him the whole story. While I'm there he calls the police and they tell him that they are on the way and they will be there in 4 hours. The ranger grabs my gun, walks me back to my trailer and says don't let anybody in. I stay up the rest of the night, listening for any sort of disturbance around me, the intense kind of listening where you're concentrating so hard on any external sounds that might be made that you almost feel deaf from the silence. After about two hours of doing this, my trailer starts rocking back and forth. I freeze. My heart drops. I can hear the sound of someone breathing extremely heavily and I'm thinking, this is it. I'm just sitting there on my bed in my trailer as it's rocking, waiting for the maniac to stop tormenting me and just break the window and stab me. I'm still listening intently to the heavy breathing and that's when I hear a grunt, a very non-human sounding grunt. I get a feeling that it's not what I think it is and I peer out the window of my trailer and a bison is scratching its back on the side of my trailer, causing it to rock back and forth. The RCPM get there at around 6.30am and proceed with their investigation for 10 hours. They close off the springs in the entire campground. We don't hear anything about what took place during the night until the investigation is over. Apparently there was a guy at the springs who made a lewd comment about one of the females in another group, which resulted in an argument. The guy disappeared and returned an hour later with a knife, stabbed two of the guys in the group, and booked it back to Fort Nelson. Not before stopping at my trailer with his buddy to tell me about the incident of course. Yeah, one of the guys at my trailer, he was the dude stabbing people. My guess is that him and his friends stopped by my trailer to try to make it seem like they were innocent. Drunken logic. The two guys that were stabbed survived, which is good. I just hope that I never have to wake up to someone like that at my door again. A couple of years ago, I was still adjusting to the adult dating scene. I was using Tinder, and though I had been on a few dates and had a few hookups, it was mostly just situations where I either wasn't that interested in the guys, or it was strictly a one night stand. It was a college town, not where I went to school, about 45 minutes from my parents' house. And I went on a few dates there. It's a cool city to hang out in, so it was always worth the journey even if a date didn't work out. I started chatting with this guy who I matched with on Tinder. He wasn't exactly my usual type, but he was charming enough. He was a little bit of the stoner slash alternative type. He was funny and confident over the phone as well. I usually made it a rule for myself to chat on the phone at least once or twice before meeting up with guys even just to gauge if we would be able to carry a conversation. It's not the same when you're only texting. We hit it off over the phone well enough to the point where I felt we should give hanging out a shot. We talked about how I went to karaoke night often at a local bar close to where I attended school. He said he and his friends liked going to karaoke too. Great. He lived in the previously mentioned college town and I agreed to attending karaoke night with him and his friends. He said they were hanging out at a local coffee shop near where he and his roommate lived and I could meet them there. A girl he knew worked there as well, and he said she'd give me a coffee on the house. Before leaving, I texted one of my friends where I was going, just to be safe. When I arrived, I could clearly see into the coffee shop. I could see a group of four scraggly looking dudes, and one girl behind the counter. As soon as I pulled up, I got a nagging bad feeling in my stomach. As soon as I got out of the car, the guy I'd been chatting with left his group and came out. He said they were leaving right now so we should just go. Not that I really cared about the coffee, but what happened to the coffee I was promised. I asked exactly what the plan was and he said they were going to head back to his place before heading to karaoke. He didn't ask if I wanted anything from the shop and didn't even ask if I wanted to come in. By this point, his friends came out and they all got close to my car. I was getting pretty bad vibes at this point. He isn't acting charming or funny like before on the phone. Everything felt forced. There was an error from the group that they were only pretending to be friendly. Nobody introduced themselves, but they just kept saying how awesome karaoke at the bar was. The girl inside at the counter had gone in the back of the shop and because she was friends with him, I didn't know if I could trust her. Thinking quickly, I said the plan sounded great and I could drive and meet them there, that I didn't want to leave my car there. This apparently was a problem. The one car in the parking lot, which I assumed was one of theirs, was the girls. They said they walked there, but it would be a lot better and faster if I just drove them back to the house. At this point I'm freaking out a bit. Everyone's close to my car and me. 
I tell them a stupid lie and say that I have a bunch of stuff from school in my car, and it's pretty messy on top of that, so not everyone will be able to fit in. Mind you, they are right by my car, standing in front of it. They can see through my windshield into it. It's got like a backpack in it, and that's just it. I just lie and say I'm kind of embarrassed because the floor is messy. I'm saying anything I can get to get out of this. I tell them I'm really sorry, but if they order an Uber, I could just meet them at their place. I'm not budging on not letting them get in my car. The guy I'm supposed to be on a date with tells the other guys to head back inside the coffee shop, and now I'm alone with him. He asks why I can't just drive everyone. He tells me it's not a big deal, and that it's just easier if I just drive everyone there. I stand firm that there's not room and my car's messy. I tell him I promise to meet him at his place if they order an Uber or walk, just text me his address. He says that it'll take too long to get back to his place, so I should just meet them at the bar instead. He won't give me his address. He texts me the address to the bar, and I apologize about the car thing. I tell him I'm so excited for karaoke and I'll meet him there. I smile and act as naturally as possible, and then I get in my car and try to drive normally while in view. As soon as I'm out of sight, I take off and just drive in different directions haphazardly before heading back home. I was constantly watching in my mirrors to see if anyone followed me, and thankfully nobody did. Not long after arriving home, I got multiple texts from him. He told me I was just another girl pretending to be nice and that I deserved to die. Clearly I made the right call. I blocked his number and blocked him on Tinder. I never heard from him again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s, I remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had taken my sister and I out to a movie, and then to get ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on her report card. I remember my dad had gotten off work later than usual, so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream, it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though, my parents were happy and proud of my sister, we had a great time, and we took up our time getting home. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30. Bedtime was usually 10, so I went straight to my room to put my pajamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember thinking that it seemed a little more chilly in the house that night, but that's the only thing out of the ordinary I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew it was bad because I heard fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really bad. I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there, and her and my parents were standing very close. My mom looked like she was on the verge of panic and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked my mom what was wrong, but she didn't want to tell me. She said we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door, I heard my dad talking to a 911 operator and telling them that when we got home, he found out her back sliding glass door shattered and objects strewn about the kitchen. He went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me. The police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside and flashing lights illuminating our entire street for hours. They never found anybody in our house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. The thing that gets to me is that nothing was stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did take was our canned food out the pantry and stack them into a small pyramid on our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to a different parts of the house. It was like someone had been in our home and did things for reasons that only made sense to them. As the police were finishing up and ready to leave, I heard one of them ask my mom a question. They talked quietly, and I'm sure they thought I didn't hear. I pretended not to be listening, but I heard everything. We kept magnetized letters on our fridge, and we used them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mom if the message on there that night was done by any of us. It wasn't. I watched my mom turn pale when we told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day. It said, Always watching. The police didn't find any fingerprints. They said the intruder had to be wearing gloves. For the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. Within a few months, we decided to move. It was all just too scary for us to stay in that area. We moved to a house several miles away. We were never bothered again, but I do still think about it. This happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck still stand up sometimes to this day. I just wish that we never experienced something like that again. In April of last year, my boyfriend and I were walking home from our friend's house, and I had just finished my first year at college and we wanted to go out and celebrate and have some fun. We live in a rural town and our friend lived on the far side of it so our walk was about a half an hour or so. I had a drink or two and smoked some of the joint they had rolled. Smoking makes me paranoid and this night was no different. Anyway, we left at maybe 10 or 11 p.m. and everything was perfectly normal until we got to the end of the long street that would eventually lead to my house. 
This street always feels so long to walk on, like hours can pass and you can barely make a dent in the amount of steps made. The street we turned onto this road was maybe 10 blocks from my house. A few minutes after we turned onto this road, I felt like something was off. But my boyfriend said that I was stoned and reassured me that it was just that. This white pickup truck that was parked in front of some house turns on and begins to drive slowly away and would then park. I watched it to see if it was just me being paranoid or not, but it proceeded to stop a couple houses down and sat there with the car still on. As soon as we get close, it would drive away, parking a little further away. This continued on until we got to the end of my street. At this point, I kept telling my boyfriend that I'm not paranoid and that this truck was screaming with us and he had gone quiet. A couple of houses down from mine, this truck drives to the end of the street, my house on the corner. There's a dead end by my house because we live near a river. It stops for a moment at the dead end and proceeds to turn on their high beams and begin to slowly drive towards us. My boyfriend takes his arm out in front of me, stopping me from walking any further as this truck continues to approach. My house is so close, yet so far. This truck slowly drives by us. The windows are tinted but we can see two silhouettes. And because they had blinded us, we didn't think to look at the license plates or even the model of the truck. My boyfriend, being pretty quick on his feet, waited until the truck disappeared from sight and took my hand before racing to my house and locking the door. He had thought about turning down one of the other streets so we could try to lose them, but he figured he'd wait until they were out of sight to book it to my house so they wouldn't see which house we went in. We looked out one of the front windows very carefully and saw this truck come back into view and began to drive around the block, I'm assuming looking for us. This went on for about 10 minutes. I called the police to inform them that we had been followed, but without the license plates or model, they could only keep their eyes open for suspicious white trucks. I was adamant that these people had to know one of us, if not me, because they drove until they were beside my house. Whether they actually knew it was my house or not, I don't know. My boyfriend tries to insist that it was probably a bunch of kids trying to mess with us, but I don't believe that. A few days later, we heard that someone was picked up and was last seen in a white truck. Since this night, there have been stories in the paper and online that people have been grabbing people and these people were trafficked in the area. I'm still seeing reports even today. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. So when I was about 15 or so, I would always go grocery shopping with my mom. This time she didn't just need groceries, but some other things that weren't close by. We lived out in the country and the closest town didn't have what she needed, so we went to the bigger town slash city about an hour away. Our last stop was the grocery store, as my mom didn't want to leave a bunch of groceries in the car on a hot summer day while she got whatever else she needed. While we were there, I noticed an older man, tall, skinny, semi-ill looking, that was paying a lot of attention to us. I also caught him talking to himself a lot. I almost ran into him when we were switching aisles and I said sorry, and since then I had seen him like 5 times and every time I felt a shudder and I looked around and he would be somewhere staring at me. I told my mom and she said we were almost done. A few minutes later we got distracted talking about ice cream. I was telling her about this ice cream brand that my brother, who's a health nut, told me about, and that it was supposed to be a lot better for you than well known name brands. We started searching for it. I was on one end of the aisle and she was on the other. I ended up finding it. I reached into the freezer to grab it. When I turned around, the old man was right behind me, like way too close. He said something like, You're too pretty to be eating that. It'll rot your teeth. And I freaked out. I pushed past him and ran back to my mom and said, Found it. Let's go. And she saw the look on my face and looked past me and saw the man. We headed quickly for the registers. And unfortunately, we had a lot of groceries and the old man got in the line next to us and only had a few things. He kept talking to himself. I was keeping a very close eye on him and was relieved when he exited the store, but unfortunately that wasn't the end of it. When we left the store I noticed him sitting in his car outside the doors. He sat there and watched us put the groceries in the car and got behind us as we went to go leave the parking lot. I was freaking out. My mom told me it would be okay and that she was right there with me. We ended up taking some back roads home. My mom thought maybe he would get lost. As I said we were about an hour away from home and the back roads made it even longer. We were about 5-10 to 10 minutes away from home and he was still following us. When I asked my mom if I should call the cops, she said, No, call your dad and tell him what's going on. Tell him to be waiting outside with the shotgun. So I called my dad and told him what was happening, and he had an idea. Since we lived way out in the country, my parents' neighbor was about half a mile down the road from us. They had a long driveway that you can't see their house from the road. He told me to have my mom go there instead so that the guy wouldn't know where we lived. My dad got there first, told the neighbor what was going on, and they both grabbed their shotguns and waited outside for us to pull up. The guy followed us down the long dirt driveway and as soon as he got to the clearing with the house, 
and saw my dad and our neighbor with their guns out, he threw his car into reverse and hightailed it out of there. So far since that incident, my family nor I have seen that man again, and I hope it stays that way. This happened a few years ago, in my old one-person flat. I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right for a few days. Like I was sure that food in the fridge was less than I put back the last time, I found pills for my couch on the floor, stuff like that. I lived alone back then, so there wasn't anyone else with access to my flat, or so I thought. Well, one night I woke up around 1 in the morning sweating from a nightmare. Since I was drenched in sweat, I decided to take a shower. So I put my phone up in the bathroom for music, turned on the water, and enjoyed my shower. A few minutes in, I heard the door move. I never close it, but it still never moves. I took a look at the shower curtain and saw a shadow against it, and a look at my phone confirmed someone was there, since I could clearly see a reflection on my screen that showed someone was standing next to the shower curtain. It took me a lot not to scream and to keep acting like I didn't notice anything, while silently taking the shower head off the holding and turning the water all the way to hot. Our water got really hot when you cranked it all the way to hot and a few seconds later steam was raising and the water hurt my feet flowing to the drain. I turned around, ripped the shower curtain open, and held the shower head right at the person behind. It was a woman and she screamed in pain. I whacked her in the face with the shower head and jumped out the shower and ran to the door, taking the key out of the lock and locking it closed behind me. A little later she started to bang on the door, but the door didn't give. I called the cops and went to the kitchen to get my big kitchen knife, just for safety. I felt like my throat was closing up when I saw it missing and realized there was only one place where it could possibly be right now. The police came and arrested the woman, who turned out to have been the former person living in the flat and was evicted after not paying rent. Seems she made a copy of the key and came into the flat when I was at work and sometimes at night. I just hope that I never have to experience that again. This happened five years ago. I was 25 and used to live alone in a small flat in England, about an hour south of London. It was a medium-sized town well known for being a good place to live, with excellent schools, low crime rates, and minimal unemployment. The kind of place where people didn't panic if they left their front door unlocked when they left for work. My flat was on the first floor above pavement level, midway down a hill. There was nobody underneath me, my flat was a kind of bridge with a footpath below it, and my kitchen window was directly over a pavement on a fairly busy road. The flat had a small galley kitchen, a living room, and an upstairs bedroom. There was nobody beneath or above my flat, and because of the hill, my kitchen window was literally face on with the pavement and where people walked. There was a printing company opposite that went out of business and then just grass. I always used to close the blinds once the sun had gone down, but liked having the kitchen window open during the afternoons. It had a safety latch so it didn't open far enough for anybody to reach in and I was not on the ground floor, so I didn't worry too much. One day, I got home from work early, about 5.30, and as it was summer I had the kitchen window open and the blinds open. I'm chopping garlic for my dinner, glance up and see an older man literally stood on the pavement watching me, only a few feet away. I glare back as if to say go away and decide to walk out the kitchen into the living room as if I'm talking to someone. I walk back into the kitchen, glance at the window and the man is still there watching me with a small smile on his face. At this point I am slightly panicked, I am alone, nobody is around as I have no direct neighbors. I go into the living room and sit against the wall, clutching my phone. I didn't want him to be able to see me at all. A lot of front doors in England have a kind of two door system, directly on the street you have a glass door, normally with decorations on them so you can't see everything in and out, just blurred images, and a proper wooden door inside. I had been out for a smoke so the glass door was shut and locked but the wooden door was wide open. From where I'm sitting, I can see the glass door, and I see a figure walking towards it. Sure enough, as it gets closer, I can see that it's the man from the pavement, standing at my front door and trying to look in. He tries opening the door, but luckily, I lock the outside door after my smoke, and it was a strong door. He drops a cigarette, says, screw it, and after about 15 to 20 seconds, he turns around and walks away. I run to shut and lock the wooden door and go to the kitchen window as he walks away and down the road. Just before he turns the corner, turns around and smiles at me, making eye contact. A few days later, it was on the local news that a man matching his description chased down a group of young women in my neighborhood. This happened almost two years ago. I had decided to go hiking with my son who was eight months old at the time, and with my dog named Henry who was an Irish wolfhound and Rottweiler mix. My husband was going fishing with a mutual friend at a state park nearby. I decided to go hike one of the more remote trails in a different part of the park and then meet them later. I drove to a wooded trail about 10 minutes from where my husband was fishing. It was an early spring day, still chilly but tolerable with the sun shining. I parked the car and got my son ready. He was smiling and laughing. 
would wear him in a forward-facing hiking sling in the front of me at the time. Henry was excited. We started off on the hike and it was a really beautiful, peaceful trail. Towering trees mixed with pine. A crystal clear creek wove its way through the trail at points. We would periodically stop and all three of us would play. About an hour and a half into the hike, we had gone about three miles and rounded a narrow bend in the trail when we nearly collided with a gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s. Henry was snarling and lunging for the man, before I even completely registered what was going on. I quickly backed up and pulled Henry back the best I could. My bumps were goosed at this point. Henry would not calm down. This is very unusual behavior for him, but none of he was trying to protect us. Trying to talk over Henry, I loudly said, I'm sorry, Henry is just very protective of my son. If you move off to the side, we can pass you. My son was very quiet during this entire exchange, which I found a bit odd. The guy was staring very intently at my son. He then laughed slightly and said, Oh, he should be. It's a good thing he's with you. Then he motioned to something around his neck and said, I'm just out here taking pictures. It's a hobby of mine. Except he wasn't wearing any kind of camera around his neck or anywhere that I could see. He had a canteen around his neck. I politely asked him again to step aside so that we could pass. At this point, Henry was sitting down but growling still. Henry would not take his eyes off this guy. I have no doubt that Henry would have eviscerated this man if he had tried anything. I am positive this guy felt that. The guy looked at Henry for a few seconds, then at my son again. He took a few steps off trail so there was room to get by and so that Henry couldn't reach him when we went by. As I warily walked by him, he was like 10 feet to my left, he muttered something about how he used to be able to see his kids. I kept looking back as we walked away to make sure he wasn't turning around to walk our way. He did continue to stare after us for several minutes though until I could no longer see him. We kept hiking and eventually came to an opening point where cars would park. There was no one there and luckily I still had cell phone reception. I called my husband. He and his friend came to pick us up right away and they took us back to my car. There was no son of the guy we encountered. We went home after that. Henry has since passed away and I am sad that my son doesn't get to grow up with him. He was really the best dog ever. So thanks Henry for being gentle yet fierce. I hope I never have to see that photographer ever again. This story happened about two years ago when I was 19 and my foster sister, Kira, was 16. It was the summer before I was going to college, and I mostly lived with my mom and Kira except for every other weekend, where I'd stay with my dad. Now, summers where I am can get really hot and humid, so we had a habit of waiting to walk the dogs until 6 or 7 p.m., because that's when it'd be cooler but still light outside. On this particular evening, mom wasn't going to be home until late, so it was up to me and Kira to walk the dogs by ourselves, unless we wanted our younger dog, Samson, to throw tantrums due to pent-up energy. Even though we lived in the countryside and could have walked them down our street, Kira and I decided to drive out 20 minutes to a park instead. At around 7.30pm, Kira and I harnessed our two dogs, packed them up in the car, and drove them to the park. Let me quickly explain the layout of the park so that it's easier to understand why we get nervous halfway through our walk. This park isn't very big, but it's popular because of its loop. The entire park is surrounded by a mile-long looping road with its attractions, like playgrounds, ponds, and a small country hall, spaced about in the inner side of the loop. The outer side is just grass, trees, and one playground at its end. Thus, it's common and expected to pass people walking the loop at least two times if you're walking in opposite directions, but not if you're walking in the same direction. Any cars on this road can only drive in one direction because it's a one-way road. At first, everything about this walk was normal. I parked the car, we clipped our dogs to leashes, and we started on the loop. Every so often, we'd stop so I could take pictures of our good boys, particularly of Kira trying to wrangle Samson, who pulls like his life depends on it and weaves around because he wants to smell everything. It was while I was taking one of these pictures that the first encounter happened. A man, who looked to be in his 40s, walked past us, walking the same direction we were, up towards the playground on the outer side of the loop. He smiled at Kira, nodded, and said, Hello, you have cute dogs, and kept walking. I honestly didn't think anything of it. We're at a park at a time of day where it's common to walk around due to the cooler temperature and people where I'm at are generally friendly. We smiled back and said hi and thanks, and that was that, or so we thought. This man passed us again only 10 minutes later, directly across from where we'd seen him previously. Just like he did before, he smiled and said hi. This time, Kira and I looked at each other once he was ahead of us and shared the, well, that was weird expression. Just 10 minutes earlier, he had passed us walking up towards the playground and subsequently broke off from the loop and he'd been walking in the same direction as us. This time though, he cut in front of us and he did it in a way where we had to stop to avoid running into him. He nearly touched Kira with how close he was walking. That was already weird in and it of itself. The other weird part was him cutting past us in the opposite direction, 
It came off almost like he wanted to walk by us again, but just like before, Kier and I brushed this weirdness off. The guy could have been enjoying a rambling stroll and doing his own thing for all we knew. Not even five minutes later, the same man passed us again, once again cutting so close past us that he nearly brushed shoulders with Kira. Again. This time he walked up behind us, then did this weird directionally slant walk to cross the street and go in the opposite direction, cutting us off again. I told Kira to hustle so we could get to our car and get out instead of doing a second loop. When we were almost to our car, we noticed a car creeping along behind us. We pulled to the side and stopped to let it pass, but for a second it stopped too. We figured whoever was in the car was getting ready to park, so we started walking again. The car started creeping along behind us soon after we did, so we stopped again and the car stopped with us. This was when Kira got nervous. We hadn't seen the middle aged guy since the third cutoff, so we figured I had overthought the whole thing, but here we were with this tinted windowed car acting weird. Was it the same guy back with his car? A different guy? We couldn't tell. Before anything could happen though, another car idled up to the one next to us and whoever it was sped up to the expected 5 miles per hour. We got to our car pretty fast after that and practically picked up the dogs to get them inside of it. We got in and got out of there. My mistake however, was neglecting my rearview mirror and the well advised rule not to drive straight home if you're worried a stranger's taking too much interest in you. We got home at around 8 something. The sun had finally disappeared behind the horizon. Mom wasn't home yet, so we got the dogs some water, locked the doors, ate a late dinner, chilled in the living room, and talked about things that didn't really matter. It was almost 9.30 when the scariest part of this whole ordeal happened. There Kira and I were, sitting on different couches, talking about something, when we noticed the ceiling briefly light up over where Kira was sitting. Due to our long, slightly curvy driveway, it's common to see headlights stream through the window, light up the ceiling, fade, then intensify. It means someone's just come home, so when the ceiling above Kira lit up, we thought nothing of it, assuming mom was finally coming back from wherever she went that night. Mom has a habit of pulling in then checking her phone for whatever knows how long before coming inside. After a couple of minutes, I noticed the small, motion sensor light mom set up on a table on the porch light up. Right after the light went off, we both heard the storm door open, but we didn't hear anyone pressing the code keys of our lock or jiggling the door handle, like mom usually does right away. The moment the storm door creaked open, our two dogs jumped up and ran to the door, barking like mad. Our golden greyhound mix, Calvin, has a deep and scary bark. Samson, who is a big dog, jumps up on his hind legs and scrabbles to one of the small windows in a desperate attempt to see who's outside. Immediately, the storm door slammed shut, and we heard heavy footsteps on the cement of our porch. Calvin started going nuts and jumped up on Kira's couch, standing on its back instead of the cushions to look out the window. Samson ran out the room and went out the doggy door that leads to the back porch, which is a ramp going down into a fenced off portion of our yard. I sat there, my mind steadily going blank as my heart sped up and my limbs refused to move. Kira gets up and spins around and looks out the window but can't see anything because, besides the motion light on the porch, it's too dark. So naturally, she gets up, grabs a stray dog toy which just so happens to be a tug of war rope with a ball on one end and opens the door. I tell her very calmly to shut the door and stay inside. She ignored me and stepped out onto the porch. She comes back inside after not seeing anything, but to my utter disbelief, she disappears into the kitchen, comes back with a knife, and goes outside again. This time, she's gone for a handful of seconds before running back inside and slamming the door shut. Breathless, she tells me she ran out a bit into the yard and saw the outline of a man by the rundown dog kennel we don't use anymore. When she saw him and froze, he moved. This time, she listened to me when I told her to lock the door. I managed to call mom and she convinced me to get up and make sure all the doors were locked, including the basement and making sure the dogs were inside. After mom got home and looked around, finding nothing, we called the non-emergency number for the police, not wanting to bother them in case we were overreacting. Two cops came by and walked around our yard and found nothing. We got the sense they didn't believe us but instead saw us as two overexcited girls with exaggerated imaginations. Still, they humored us and told us, after we told them about the park, that if we think anyone might be following us, or if someone's acting a little too creepy, not to drive straight home and to check if anyone's following us. Then, they left. But when we heard those footsteps and Kira went outside, she swears she saw someone. The dogs don't run up to the door like that and bark their heads off if no one's there. I don't know if whoever was at our house was the same guy that ran into us at the park. If it was, I don't know the reason why he cut in front of us multiple times. I don't know if he was in the car that inched behind us and stopped when we stopped. I don't know what would have happened if Calvin didn't have a scary and manic bark. I don't know much of anything, but what I do know is, if you're out and about, minding your own business, and a stranger is taking a lot of notice of you, following you, frequently running into you, or whatever, trust your gut.
Don't drive or walk straight home, meander, get to a public space, or just take your time. Pay attention to your surroundings. You never know who is watching you. This happened a few years ago when I was an 18 year old girl in high school. I worked at a store in the mall of my mid-sized midwestern city, and that evening, I worked a closing shift. I was walking back to my car in the snowy darkness when a black SUV pulled up beside me. A woman opened the window and yelled, hey, excuse me, I need your help. She was a round-faced woman in her 30s or 40s, and spoke with a very heavy Spanish accent. She went into a story about how her sister got into a car accident and the woman needed to get gas in her car before she could help the sister. However, she could not find a gas station and had no money. She even said she had driven around to several churches to ask for help, but no one would help her. She was difficult to understand and did not tell the story super clearly, but I understood that she needed to find a gas station and she needed me to pay for it. She told the story between sobs and she seemed so desperate that I was moved to help her. I told her that she could follow my car to a gas station that was just across the highway and that I would buy her some gas. At the gas station, I parked in front of the store and was surprised when she did not pull up to a gas pump. As I had expected. I got out of my car and said, okay, don't you want me to buy and pump gas for you? She then said something like I had misunderstood her first story. She didn't need gas. She needed money to give to her sister and added a bunch of other facts I don't remember to continue the story. Her accent and changing story was difficult to understand. I said, well I don't have cash on me, only my card. I mean I suppose I could see if there's an ATM inside. She immediately replied that she knew there was, which definitely is suspicious in hindsight, but I didn't pick up on it at the time. I agreed to go in and get her some money from the ATM, and as I turned to go inside, she said, wait, but if you give me money, I will have to repay you somehow. I said, no, that's okay, you don't have to. She said, no, give me your phone number so I can contact you to meet up later so I can repay you, or give me your address and I will send the money to you. I refused both, and she tried again several more times, begging me to meet up with her later to give me the money. This probably lasted five minutes or so. Finally, as I refused her last time, she said in a very chilling way, don't be so nice. Despite all of this, I for some reason was still convinced she needed my help, and I went into the gas station to use the ATM. However, in my teenage wisdom, I could not remember my PIN number, and was unable to withdraw money. I went back outside to tell the woman, and she rolled her eyes, puffed something under her breath, and very quickly got into her car and sped off. I never saw her again after that. As I drove home, I became suspicious about the scenario. I figured out after a while that the woman was definitely trying to scam me for my money, but it disturbed me more that she tried so hard to get me to meet up with her later and give her contact information. I just hope that I never have to meet someone like that in the future. When I was young, I used to live in rural Pennsylvania. Where I lived wasn't quite suburbs, but the houses were all within walking distance of each other, and we knew nearly all of our neighbors. My small neighborhood was blocked off from the ones on either side by decent sized creeks, and to get to them, you needed to climb down a fairly steep slope. This is an important detail later. My friend Rachel was a bit younger than me, by two or three years. I was 11 at the time. We had decided to go on a bike ride and ended up dropping our bikes and helmets at the top of the hill leading down to one of the creeks and we went exploring. We were making a racket, I'm sure, squealing as we jumped around trying not to get wet. We noticed bubbles in the water and became concerned for the swans that lived down at the other end of the creek in the pond. Out of nowhere we heard a man chuckling and he was standing at the top of the hill above near where we were standing. I said nothing. He asked what we were doing and slowly started making his way down the rough terrain of the slope. He obviously didn't know where the path to come down was. Rachel answered him that we were trying to find out where the bubbles were coming from and that she was scared it would hurt the swans, as there had never been any bubbles before today. He told us he could take a water sample and test it if we could bring it up to him. Then asked our names and how old we were, still making his way down to us the entire time. Rachel told him her name and had started to say mine when I stopped her by grabbing her shoulder. I had an extremely bad feeling about this man and I was very uncomfortable with the situation. I perked my head up looking off to the side and asked her, did you hear that Rachel? I think your mom is calling us. I turned and dragged her up the path across from where the man was climbing down at and we jumped on our bikes. I noticed this man's car parked next to where we put our bikes. Our helmets were missing. We heard the man scrambling after us screaming that he hadn't heard anything. We started pedaling back toward my house, as Rachel lived in a different neighborhood, and the man started following us in a car after he finally reached the top. The man was still trying to get us to talk to him, so I turned off into my uncle's yard where I saw my cousin out cutting the lawn and started yelling for him. He was a big dude, 16 or so at the time, and the man in the car burnt rubber speeding off when he saw we were no longer alone. We ended up calling the police and we were not the first girls that had the same issue with the man of that description and that car that day. So whatever that man's intentions were, I'm just glad that Rachel and I didn't have to experience them.
If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This was my very first apartment and I was so excited to be in it. My freshman year I lived in a dorm on campus, and before that I just lived with my mom, so I had never lived on my own before. The apartment was a two bathroom and two bedroom and I shared it with my friend who I had known since we were 13. I had just turned 20 when all this happened. Josh was my friend and it was his first year at the university, so naturally I showed him around. We did pretty much everything together. Fast forward to the homecoming football game. We attend a university that's crazy into football and we're actually a pretty good team, so the homecoming game is a big deal to everyone. Josh was so excited to go out because it was his first homecoming game. He was going to go with this boy he started flirting with and he wanted me to come along. I don't really remember why I didn't want to go, I just didn't. Josh got mad at me, we said dumb stuff to each other and he left, so I was alone for the rest of the night. I had, still do, a small dog, Poppy, who lived with us. She was around a year old at the time. We actually had a pretty relaxing night in the beginning. I took a shower and put on face mask and Poppy and I watched TV in bed and stuff. I remember listening to a song on repeat the entire day because that's what I do when I find a new song that I like. To this day, I still can't listen to it without being reminded. We went to sleep around 10pm I think. I wasn't keeping up with what was going on with the football game, so I really have no idea if it was just ending or whatever, but I knew not to expect Josh home early because he was going out with the guy he was seeing, Dinlan, afterwards. There is a strip of bars along one of the main roads running towards campus, and that's where they would be. That's where everyone would be after the game ended. I don't know what time it was, but I woke to cabinets being slammed and really loud noises. It was really dark in my room and the only thing I could see was that the kitchen lights were on. I saw the light coming through the bottom of the door. It sounded like people were going through our kitchen cabinets one by one. Poppy was at the edge of the bed barking like a crazy dog. I had never seen her act this way. I was struggling to keep myself awake because I'm a really heavy sleeper, not anymore, and I just knew it wasn't Josh or Dylan, but some stupid part of me decided to call out, hello, but it was weak sounding and I really don't know if they heard me or not. Suddenly my bedroom door opened. I shot up. Poppy was snarling and trying to lunge at the stranger in my bedroom. I couldn't see anything because the light from the open door was kind of blinding. I just saw his figure. He was wearing a hoodie and he stood there for maybe 15 seconds and I was just staring at him. The whole time Poppy was trying to screw him up. He quickly closed my door and I don't know why I just didn't move. Then my door flings open a second time and we're staring face to face again for the same painfully long amount of time. My heart was racing and I remember thinking he's going to hurt me. Now that I look back, I should have screamed or something. Poppy was at the very edge of the bed now, vicious and snarling. She sounded like a big dog honestly. And then he slammed my door shut. As soon as he did, I jumped out of my bed and locked my door. I heard them take my car keys. I was terrified they would find my car and steal it since I had just parked directly outside. I frantically called 911 and was sobbing the whole time. I said, someone is in my house, they came in my room, please help. And it took them 30 minutes to get there, when I know that there were cop cars everywhere surrounding the bars since it was homecoming, which I live a 5 minute drive from. When I finally came out, the living room and my roommate's bedroom were completely ransacked. My roommate's TV was on the floor because they tried to carry it out, but I guess decided just to leave it. They stole my Xboxes and all my games. They stole my book bag with my textbooks and my homework in it. The two policemen got here and I told them everything and asked if I could call my roommate. Josh picked up the phone but was heavily slurring and I could tell that he was inside of a bar and could barely hear me. I just screamed please give Dylan the phone, hoping that Dylan was at least more sober than Josh was, so Josh put Dylan on the phone. And I don't know how, through my tears and sobs and through the screaming people and house music, but he heard me say that our apartment was robbed. He frantically said we are coming and hung up. They probably ran. While I was waiting for them, one of the policemen asked if he could try to take prints from my roommate's TV and I agreed. He proceeds to then drop his flashlight directly on the screen and as it shattered, he just looked at me. So then Josh and Dylan get back and the policemen totally change their tone. They get aggressive and say that they were targeted for a reason. I'm pretty sure that since it was homecoming, the robbers were not expecting me to be there and were trying to just rob apartments blindly. We also lived on the ground floor so it's easier to get in those than in the two story and three story apartments. Josh is in the military, but Josh looks just like any other regular college freshman boy and his only friends at the time were literally me and Dylan, so we were the only ones who knew he was in the military. They tried to accuse Josh of stashing guns and drugs everywhere and that's why we got robbed. I literally was like, are you kidding me? They then tried to pull me to the side and say that Josh hired people to come rob his own apartment while I was inside. They asked me, how do you know these guys? I said, sir, I have known Josh since we were 13. We moved here together to attend university together. He just gave me a look. When they left, we got our locks immediately changed and then I had to take the next day off of school to drive to the nearest Nissan dealership, 30 minutes away, and then wait 7 hours for them to rewire a key fob for me. 
To the men who robbed me, and to the cops who accused my roommate of robbing his own apartment, I hope I don't have to meet you again. This happened to me four years ago when I was 16 years old on a school trip, but I still remember it to this day. I had recently graduated from one school and enrolled in another, more advanced one via special program. Germany's system of education is sometimes complicated. There were about 20 people who did the same as me and we were all put in one class to catch up with the regular students. To get to know each other better, the class went on a three day trip to a youth hostel in our county town. The trip was organized by our school and overall pretty nice. Two of my friends had transferred with me and we had fun, except for the second evening. It was late summer and the sun was still up despite it already being around 7 p.m. One of my friends, Sarah, and I decided that we wanted to go for a walk before accompanying our other classmates to the river to have some drinks. We wanted to visit the newly built benches along the river and just talk for a bit. To get to those benches, we walked over a long parking lot next to the river. Between the parking lot and the river, there was a small path which was, in some places, divided from the parking lot by a small grass strip with a few bushes and trees. On the other side of the parking lot, there was a bridge approach which could be used by cars and pedestrians alike. This will get relevant later. There were some rocks in the parking lot to prevent cars from driving too far and falling into the river. My friend and I had some fun by jumping from one rock to the other. At some point, a man on a bicycle, probably in his early 20s, emerged next to us on the other side of the parking lot. He applauded us for some weird reason we didn't understand. My friend applauded back ironically and we just continued walking but stopped jumping on the rocks. When we arrived at the benches, we chose the first one we came across and sat down. Bicycle guy stopped right next to us, got off his bike and just lingered. I started to feel uneasy but since there were no free benches left, I thought he just wanted to hang out there too. At some point, he pulled out his cell phone and called someone. Even though he was right next to us the whole time, I couldn't understand him because he was speaking a foreign language. Sarah and I sat there for about 1-2 to two hours until it started getting darker. Bicycle guy was still right next to us and still on the phone, circling the area around us and just generally creeping us out by continuously staring at us. At this point, Sarah had also started feeling uneasy and we shared our feelings about this guy. Since it was almost dark, there was no one around anymore. We wanted to return to the hostel. The second we got up and started walking towards the parking lot, Bicycle guy also got onto his bike. My heart sank into my stomach when I realized he was going the same direction. Just slow enough to stay next to us. He continued following us. When exiting the bench area, Sarah and I took the path next to the river to get to the parking lot. Directly at the beginning of the parking lot, there was one part where the path had one of the strips with trees next to it. Bicycle guy directly went past us and onto the parking lot, passing the trees on the right side. We went to the left. He continued staring at us before he went further ahead. The second Sarah and I set a foot on the path, I stopped her and told her that if he turned around after the trees to get onto our path, which he would have no reason for if he didn't want anything from us, we would turn around and run the opposite direction. Well, bicycle guy turned onto our path. We booked it out of there as fast as we could while desperately clutching each other's hands while bicycle guy was following us. There was not a single person around to help us so running was our only chance. We couldn't process what was happening to us in that moment, but we just knew that we needed to run. Remember the bridge approach I mentioned earlier? We went across the smallest part of the parking lot and went up there so we could take another route back. While walking up the narrow sidewalk, still grabbing each other's hands, we glanced down onto the parking lot. If I hadn't been sure that he was following us, then I definitely was in that moment. Down on the parking lot there was Bicycle Guy, circling the area and staring us down while we were almost running up the bridge. It got even worse. We were halfway up when suddenly, Another guy on a bicycle passed us and stopped a few meters in front of us. He started talking to Bicycle Guy who had been following us and then also stared at us. Bicycle Guy had basically called another friend over for whatever he was trying to do. Sarah and I immediately changed to the other side of the bridge approach and took the stairs down there. We chose to take a route where we wouldn't be alone on the streets. I was shaking the whole walk back. I am incredibly thankful for my gut feeling. To this day, I still think about this encounter when I'm walking somewhere alone in the evening or night. I don't think I'll be able to forget this anytime soon. For background, my family moved to the countryside from the city when I was about 7 years old, and I'm 21 now. Both my parents had grown up in the suburbs, and I lived in the capital of our state for about 10 years before we moved. It definitely took us some time to get used to the train tracks that ran by our house, the wild animals, the weird but kind neighbors, and the odd visitors. Another thing is that if you get off the main road and turn onto a long gravel drive to get up to our house, we can see the entire length of the driveway from certain points in our yard, which is about 3 acres. A few years after we moved in, my dad got a promotion at work, and as a result, started to go to conferences and business trips that lasted from a few days to a week, at least a couple times a year. My mom felt nervous about being home alone with two young kids. I was 10 and my brother was 6, and so we decided to get a dog. 
We knew we wanted a big dog, but something that would be gentle with my brother and I. After a few weeks looking at shelters, we took home Rocky. He was 9 months when we took him home, and already pushing 70 pounds. We believe he's a German Shepherd mixed with some northern or mountain breed. We aren't sure to this day, but he's a massive red colored dog with a long black muzzle and ears, and a fluffy tail that he carries over his back, and a white stripe up his nose. It wasn't long until he was 100 pounds, and an absolute force to be reckoned with. Even though he was very gentle with both my brother and I, loved our cats, it was a big ball of joy around anyone we brought into our house, he tended to be very territorial and aggressive with other dogs, and very protective of us, especially of my mom and I. Once, the electric company came to do work on the telephone poles on our property, without telling us first, and after 20 minutes they finally had to call us because Rocky had them trapped in their truck, It was jumping up and barking at their windows. I doubt he would really have attacked them if they'd gotten out of their trucks, but it was more than enough to make them think twice. This protective instinct came in very, very handy one day. It was summertime, my dad was at work, and my mom was home with my brother and I, since she was a teacher and all for the summer with us. My mom was working in our garden, and my brother and I were playing close by, with Rocky watching over all of us. Rocky all of a sudden sounded the alarm, throwing his head up in the air and barking and howling. He makes a deep woo-woo noise. I looked up to see a dirty white pickup truck pull off from the main road and into our driveway. This wasn't necessarily alarming at first, as people sometimes used our driveway to turn around when they got lost. But the white pickup truck slowly ambled up our drive, and I could see something strange in the bed. It was lumpy and discolored, but I couldn't really tell what it was until he pulled all the way up to our house, where our other cars were, and honked the horn to get our attention. It was meat. Giant, red chunks of meat with some of the limbs of various animals still attached. It was the creepiest thing I had ever seen in my life. Just a weird man who looked to be in his early 50s, driving a pickup truck full of meat in the southern July heat. I immediately just got a really, really bad vibe from the guy. And I remember my mom telling my brother and I to go inside, and we did, but watched out the glass door. Rocky had surprisingly been quiet at that point, but was now next to my mom, and she had her hand around his collar. The guy rolled down his window and asked my mom if she wanted to purchase some meat. My mom said no and to please leave our property. Instead, he went on about the different types of meat and asking how much we wanted, beef, venison, pork, etc. My mom asked him to leave again, but instead, he decided to get out of the nasty white pickup. As soon as his feet were on the ground, Rocky went ballistic, barking and snarling. This finally made the guy stop. He looked at Rocky, looked at my mom, and asked, Does your dog bite? And my mom, deathly serious, replied, Only if I tell him to. The guy took one more look at Rocky, and I'm guessing decided not to mess with the giant, snarling beast. He got back in his truck, backed up, and headed back down our driveway. I don't know if he was really selling the meat or not, but apparently he'd been around to our neighbors, who also had gotten a really bad vibe from him. We'll never know what he was really up to with his giant slabs of meat in the bed of his pickup truck. Maybe he was just a weird guy trying to sell some sketchy meat. Maybe he was looking for something else. We never saw that guy again. Rocky's still kicking it, by the way. He's almost 15 and completely deaf, but he's still out in the yard on summer days, watching over us. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago, by myself and my two dogs. We were four days in, around 20 miles at least as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7,000 feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So when we got to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up slash make dinner, etc. But I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up this steep tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Now the day before, I had found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago, and I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement, before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So while still concerned, I started hiking up the steep hill to hand the bag. It was so steep I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down, before making another 5-6 to six step push to the next tree I could just lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making up this hill ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about 100 feet up the hill, and I hear a whole lot of big movement at about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage, slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest, and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in a matter of seconds. Because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try to save me, in which he will most likely die. 
and I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12-15 foot cliff onto the boulders below, like hundreds of 5-20 to 20 foot boulders, so I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. Then I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at my campsite, which is just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent, so she didn't wander off like I was away, so yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after I kinda snap back to it, I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order. I call my dog back to me. He comes and sits against my feet as my back is against a tree, so I'm kinda pinned slash stuck there for a moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there so I let him lean against me while I try to collect myself. This is when I realized I'd completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast up to turn my lamp on, I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline dumps going right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the eyes of whatever is up there, peering and peering, nothing. But I just heard- but I had just heard something, we both did, and whatever it was didn't get away or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there, so I'm kinda just steadfast at this point. I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, and at one point my dog lunges forward, unpinning me. He does a fake slash bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this I finally see movement, something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon slash sunset. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I make out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes but some raggedy stuff with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly, actually almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes and his face was covered in dirt or something, but I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment, so I stare for what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared. And I also had to get off that hill before total dark, where I could be seriously hurt slash risk dying trying to get back down. So carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up and look in that direction again, just to make it even more clear I saw him, and eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking just to bark back or at my dog, but when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling with her tail sticking straight out. Still trying to hold it together, I thought okay maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out, but I was positive I had zipped it so the zipper tap slash openings was at the very top of the tent door, out of reach. So in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my pistol. I fired a single shot into the air as the sun was setting, climbed into my tent without eating, and lay with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up I was packing up my stuff and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucks. It was all downhill back, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I had made it to the last camp, about 4 miles from my vehicle, but thankfully there were other people there. We sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They started to tell me they are planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning, so I tell them my story in detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw all that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on, other people had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago and a woman found murdered last year. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005 when I was about 13 years old. It took place in a rural area, a good ways outside the town of Uvalde, Texas. The town itself was really small back then and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about 1,000 acres, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about 7 hours on my dad's hard top Jeep Wrangler. That car was so uncomfy, I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish in my youth. 
The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone else lease it that year yet and the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life I had been in scouts for a couple years and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land we settled in, the cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remembered that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out, then setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7am. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hawks. Typical torn up ground where they had been rooting so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there. Not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're hunters. This is private land. The person didn't move at all. Dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. The weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and it looked like to be ski pants. Now this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again. No reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnap the clip to his pistol holster. We approached the person's right side and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man all the while talking to him asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man and my dad stood straight up with a confused look on his face. I called out and said what's wrong and he called back saying it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring and as I got closer one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new, no dust, sap, bird droppings or signs of being outside for more than any more than a day at most. At that moment I looked at my dad and could see him get worried, almost immediately after I felt that feeling again like we were being watched and I knew my dad felt it too. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panic tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified so it felt like an eternity, but in reality it was only about 45 minutes. After returning we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out the next week when he was in the area. He also said that he never had an issue with people because his property was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home we talked and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping too. Turns out that next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found any trace of anyone, no mannequin or anything. That story still makes my hair stand on end. I honestly have no idea what that mannequin was. So this happened to me a couple of years ago when my now husband and I were living in a townhouse in a pretty decent area. My husband was working third shift as a corrections officer at our local corrections facility and I was working as a waitress slash bartender. It was an unusually warm night for mid-March so I took advantage and decided to take my husband's 80 pound Alaskan Malamute Siberian Husky mixed dog on a quick walk around the neighborhood near our complex. We get to the end of the street that leads into the complex we live in and across the street is a marathon gas station. I notice as the dog, Luke, stops to relieve himself that there's a guy across the street at the gas station with a case of beer in his hands. I have my phone out texting a friend and looked back up to notice the guy was near the stop sign, also relieving himself on the sign. I felt really awkward and instantly put my phone away and led Luke down the street on our path. At this point I think this guy noticed us and he crossed the street to where Luke and I had just been. I hear him walking a few feet behind me and just keep my head down staring at my phone with Luke glued to my hip. After about 10 seconds, I hear this guy's steps getting closer. Luke realizes there is someone behind us and he stops in his tracks. Mind you, he's a big dog compared to my 5'2 self, but I can handle him pretty easily and he's a very well trained dog by my husband. But I noticed his ears were perked up and his tail was straight up. I was glad that he was aware of our surroundings, but I still wanted to keep moving and away from this guy. This guy finally catches up so I tighten my grip on Luke's leash and pull him closer to me and step into the grass to allow this guy to pass us and keep Luke out of his way. Does this guy keep going on and pass? Nope. 
When I thought he was about to pass us, I stuttered out a small apology because Luke was pulling on his leash a little to investigate this guy, and most people did get intimidated by him just by his size. The guy stops and just stares at me for a minute, long enough for me to smell the cigarettes and booze rolling off of him and to notice he is probably in his mid to late 20s, dark hair, scruffy looking, and just dirty. He smiles and then finally seems to notice Luke trying to get at him and asks, cute dog, what's his name? Instead of making up a name, I just say Luke. He then proceeds to ask me if he can pet my dog and before I can even give him an answer, he leans down to start petting Luke's head. Luke did not like that. Luke jumped at him as a warning and the guy backed up chuckling. I apologized and mentioned that he was very protective and made up a lie that he was trained as my dad's former K9 unit. My dad is a software developer. Instantly, I saw this guy's face change. He asked me what my name was and I gave him a fake name. He then asked me if I lived around here and I said I was visiting a friend of mine for the weekend. He then made a sudden step towards me and I'm not lying when I say I have never heard my husband's dog growl in the five years I have been with him. But the sound that came from my dog sounded like something coming from nightmares. Luke's hair was spiking on his spine and he was throwing himself up on his back legs and kicking his from legs at this guy. He had put himself completely between myself and the guy and snapping at him. This freaked the dude out so much he stumbled backward nearly dropping his beard. He quickly said, we'll have a nice night cutie, and stumbled off down the road. When I say my heart was pounding, it was deafening. I grabbed Luke's leash so hard and sprinted between the buildings until I got back to my townhouse and locked all the doors and collapsed by the front door. Luke was in my face the whole time kissing me and whining. This dog is the sweetest and most gentle creature I have ever met and hearing him growl and seeing him react the way he did made me realize that I needed to get out of the situation and fast. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Often, I enjoy walking my dog at nighttime. This is due to the fact that my dog is harder to walk when people are around with their own dogs. So, we tend to walk around parks in the area when they've been become somewhat secluded. My 120 pound black boxer slash lab named Loki could be somewhat considered threatening to most from what I hear. I figured his size would be used as a deterrent for anyone looking to cause nightly troubles. I was dead wrong. On one specific night in the fall of 2016, I could recall of an encounter that reminds me of why I am so reluctant to walk around once daylight falls. This specific park is one I have been to a couple times and from what I remember, this park is usually secluded around 6.30 and later. Aside from a couple of joggers or very few other dog walkers, not many people walk the same path I take. I also like to put on my headphones and listen to music while I walk, but on this specific night I chose not to wear them since my phone was on low battery and I wanted to preserve it as long as I could. Anyway, the walk was going as usual. Loki did his business and we continued on our usual path. About midway in our walk, I realized that it had started to get really dark. Since he was done with his business, I decided to cut the walk somewhat short and we took a shortcut that kind of led us off the path. This path had a bunch of trees surrounding the area and there were still leaves in the branch. With that being said, I felt a weird feeling as if I was being watched. I could not for the life of me shake off the feeling of being watched. I peered back to see if anyone had been following me out of anxiety and every time I did, no one was there. In fact, no one was anywhere. This whole shortcut was essentially secluded. Suddenly, Loki stopped walking and also looked back. I told him, Loki, come on boy, we've gotta go. One thing I failed to mention was that Loki is a big coward. I noticed his tail was tucked between his legs, which is a telltale sign that a dog is afraid. I was also curious and a bit nervous, but I surely did not want to find out what he heard or noticed. I just wanted to get out as soon as possible. I pulled a little and he began to walk, but every now and then I'd see him peer back. After maybe a minute or so of him walking, he stopped again and this time he began to growl. Despite being a coward, Loki is a bark but no bite kind of dog, so I took this chance to see exactly what he was growling at. It was quite dark, so I could not see well, so I used my phone's flashlight to see what was up. Trees, just trees. What he heard was probably some kind of small animal. Once again, I turned around and kept walking. He continued to peer back once in a while still, but this time I noticed it was a lot more frequent. I just said to myself, just squirrels, maybe a bird, and I ignored it. Then, I heard what appeared to be actual footsteps and branches breaking. There is absolutely no way a small animal could have produced a sound like that. Look, he turned around quick and still with his tail tucked, he began to growl and bark at a figure that I could only describe as a man in his early 50s, possibly late 40s, appear from out the woods. He was dressed in dirty clothing. His hair was long and was graying. He had one hand in his pocket and he said to me, Nice dog you have there, kid. What breed is he? He's a boxer slash lab, I replied. Oh, I love dogs. Mind if I pet him? He wondered. The man got closer and emerged from the trees. As he got closer, I realized that he was quite tall. Loki instantly got bad vibes. He ran behind me and started to bark at him. Actually, I do kind of mind. My dog here doesn't like strangers. 
Sorry, but it's probably not best if you pet him, I quickly stated. It's okay, really, he seems like a friendly guy, just a little pet wouldn't harm him. The man retorted as he got closer. I felt extremely uncomfortable, as he appeared to get closer and closer. I don't know why this guy couldn't take no for an answer. I'm really sorry man, I'm scared he'd bite you or something, I told him as I began to walk away. I don't know why you just won't let me introduce myself to him, the guy replied angrily. This time I began to speed walk. I was very uncomfortable and my fight or flight instincts began to take over. He followed us and kept muttering curses to himself. I don't know if this man was under the influence of something, but he did not let up. I won't lie, I started to get a little angry. Why can't a guy just take no for an answer? He began to match my speed, almost as if he was trying to catch up to us. Loki and I both took this as an answer to start sprinting a bit. I don't remember much of the running, it was all a blur to me, but I do remember the spine tingling feeling of hearing his footsteps rapidly increasing behind me. For a man of his stature, he was quite fast. I also realized that his intentions may have not been just to pet my dog. No one reasonable would go that far just to pet a dog that clearly wanted nothing to do with him. I looked behind me and he was in pursuit. Maybe about 10 feet behind me he was chasing us. Finally, the path led to the park exit and into the busier streets. I lived about 10 minutes away from the park. I made sure no one was following me and I even made sure to walk on the populated streets. After what seemed like an eternity, we got home but I knew for a fact that I was not going to get any sleep. From my window in the porch, I watched all night with Loki, just to see if anyone had followed us home. I also made a police report with my parents. After all, this guy seemed to have been quite suspicious and who knows what his true intentions were. Ever since, I haven't walked Loki in that park. I've also made it a habit of mine to walk on livelier streets at night. If I could give anyone one piece of advice, even if you live in a relatively safe town, do not ever let your guard down. This happened about a year ago to me and my husband. It was our 10th anniversary, so we decided to go camping, just the two of us, and of course our dog. There is a big national park slash camping area near where we live, little less than an hour drive. So that was where we were heading. It's basically a big forest with many small lakes, ponds, trails, and camping sites around. Pretty popular place during summer, but we still saw some people, even though it was late September and the weather was cold. We found a good spot next to a lake to set up our camp. It was a beautiful day, so we wanted to hike a bit in the forest. There was a nice long path that was going around the lake where we had our camp, so we chose to go that way. The lake was quite small, and there was another camping site by it. You could see there from our camp, and from there you could see our camp. They were almost on opposite sides of the lake. We walked past another camp, and saw a man there alone just standing and staring at us, not answering when we greeted him. He was maybe in his late 20s, around the same age as us. I thought at that point that maybe he was just shy and a little weird. He had a small tent set up and some other stuff all around the place, so I figured he had been there for a while. We just continued walking and didn't think much to it. Eventually we got to our camp and started to set up our tent before it's too dark. We made some food by the fire and just sat there enjoying the peace. Suddenly, our dog starts barking like crazy. She was tied to a long wire around a tree. We immediately realized that she wasn't just paranoid and that there was something really in the woods and it was near. It had been very dark for hours at this point. I took the dog to a leash and my husband started to look around with his bright headlamp. Our dog just kept barking. We were confused and sure it was some kind of animal, maybe a bear or a moose, but we couldn't understand why it wasn't scared of us and why it wouldn't run away. My husband went ahead to the path that leads to the other camp. Right when he got to the path, which was just less than 10 meters away from our camp, he saw something on the ground. I told him to go check it out and followed with our dog. He stopped, turned at me and said, it's a human, laying on the ground. The first thing I thought was that maybe they were hurt or dead or something. They just laid there not moving, facing the ground. We asked, are you okay? Are you hurt? And they just suddenly stood up. Turned out, it was the guy from the other camp. He was very scared of our dog and told me to not let her near him. I was kind of relieved that it wasn't some bear that was going to eat us, but I soon learned that a bear might have been less scarier than this guy. After he stood up, he walked straight to our campfire and sat down. My husband tried to ask him multiple times why he was sneaking in the dark forest without any light. He didn't give us an answer. We even laughed a bit and told him how we thought that he was a bear or something, but he didn't even smile, just stared at the fire, looking annoyed. His right leg was soaking wet. He probably stepped off the path and dipped it in the lake on his way to our camp. He sat with us for 30 minutes, not talking much. He also clearly wanted to know where our dog was at all times. I saw he had a knife hanging from his belt, but I guess it's not that weird when you're in the woods. Every few minutes he put his hand in his pocket and just peeked at whatever was in there. Kind of like checking the time on your phone without taking it out from your pocket, but it wasn't a phone he had there. I felt very uncomfortable and anxious by the whole situation. So, when the 30 minutes had passed, he again stood up and mumbled about going back to his own camp and left. He never gave us any explanation of why he came to our camp or why he was stalking us in the dark. He 
tried very hard not to be seen when we found him. When I thought he was far enough, I told my husband that there's no way I'm sleeping in that tent. The biggest nope ever. Fortunately for me, he agreed and said that that guy might come back when we are sleeping. I just wanted to leave as soon as possible, so my husband started packing up things up. There were cars nearby, thank goodness, and I was guarding and looking around with the light if he comes back. Just when we had almost all of our stuff in the car, I saw a quick flash of light on the path from the guy's camp towards ours. He was coming back. Maybe he thought we went to sleep because he couldn't see our campfire anymore. So yeah, we got in the car and left real quick. I don't know if we overreacted, but I had such a bad feeling about him. Hugh crawls in the dark, wet forest alone just to stalk some strangers. What would have he done if our dog wouldn't have hurt him? What were his motives? I don't know and didn't want to stay there and find out. I'm just glad that we had our dog with us. There's a chance that she saved our lives. This happened to me when I was 19 and in college. I met a guy named Sam through a friend of a friend. Sam seemed nice enough and I would see him around but that's as far as it went. One day we managed to end up alone as I'm coming out of my building, he sees me and starts chatting me up. At first it was simple small talk, but I became uncomfortable once he starts complimenting me saying I have nice teeth. Not nice smile, but nice teeth. I thought this was a weird way to phrase a compliment, but I just ignore it. He then goes on to ask me, what are you? Meaning he wants to know my ethnicity. I tell him I am Latina. He asks if I speak Spanish and I say yes. He makes a comment saying he likes Shakira's music and that he likes her song La Tortua. He then asks me what La Tortura means. I tell him it translates to the torture. I notice his eyes get wide and he starts smiling. At this point I'm done talking to him and I tell him I have to go. I make a mental note to stay away from him after that because throughout the rest of the conversation he had a really creepy smile on his face. I get busy with classes so I forget about him quickly. One day I get a call on my cell phone from an unknown number. I decide to answer it and I hear a raspy male voice breathe heavily and say, La Tortura. I hang up and think what was that, but I just take it as a stupid prank and move on with my day. For the next week or two I keep getting calls from an unknown number but I don't answer. Weeks go by. I have forgotten about the phone calls when I end up running into Sam again outside my building. He starts making small talk again then with a giant grin he says, have you been getting any phone calls lately? It takes me a second to realize that it's been him calling me from that unknown number. I don't want him to see me reacting so I say no, but internally I'm freaking out. He then goes on to tell me, I've been watching you through your window for weeks and you never noticed. For context, my dorm room window was split into three parts. One big glass pane in the middle, but two smaller panes on either side that you could open for fresh air. If those side panels were open enough, you had enough room to slip your hand in, move the curtain out the way, and get a good look inside. Obviously after that I was thoroughly creeped out and was wondering how many times he watched me dress, nap, or do any of the other things you do in the comfort of your own space. I ended the conversation somehow and wondered what I should do. After I calmed down I decided to report what he said to me to my residential advisor and then reported it to the director of housing at our school. Luckily the director took the situation seriously and encouraged me to report him to campus police. A report was made, they would have to speak to him to get his response to my allegations and I was told that in the meantime if he approaches me again I should come back and make another report. A couple of days later the director of housing comes to my dorm to tell me that campus police spoke to Sam and he admitted to them that he told me he had been watching me but that it was all a joke. He was told to stay away from me and I was told to report him again if he kept harassing me but it never went further than that. Over the next few days I end up telling the girls in my dorm what happened with Sam. They obviously think it's gross so we make plans to go out on campus as a group for the time being and to keep our curtains closed. Going out as a group definitely made me feel safer and everything was fine for a little while until, one day, we are coming out of the dorm dining hall and we run into Sam and some of his friends. He sees me, gets visibly upset, and starts approaching me yelling, why did you tell him what I said? I got scared thinking he might do something, but luckily my dorm mates rallied around me and rushed me out of there. I knew he was mad about reporting him because before this happened our mutual friend, a male, had told me he's mad that you reported him. Thankfully, this is the last time I was ever near that guy. The school year ended soon after this happened. I moved off campus, got a new friend group, and moved on. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't made a report and ignored him. When I was 16 I used to attend English classes that were for people of all ages. So I was used to having colleagues older than me that also wanted to improve their language skills. I was really close to another girl my age back then, Jasmine. She was much more popular than me, so she would always introduce me to new people. One day I noticed this guy in her group. He was 32 and very talkative, always smiling. For some reason though he made me feel uncomfortable from the get go. I think it's because he would stare at me for no apparent reason. While everyone was talking as a group, he seemed to address me specifically every time, but I didn't give him much thought. As the days passed he started waiting around before my classroom door and started conversations about my friendship with Jasmine, my high school, my family, etc. 
I thought it was weird that he was so interested, given that he was much older, but I felt guilty for feeling bad. Like he was just being nice and I was being mean to think he was weird. I should have listened to my instinct. Instead, I forced myself to answer, to make small talk. He told me how close he was with Jasmine and that made me feel a bit safer. When I asked her about him though, she said she didn't know him that well, but that he seemed nice enough. One day I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. When I picked it up, it was him. He said he got my number from Jasmine. I was upset and confronted her about giving my number to him and she said he insisted so she ended up agreeing to it. He started calling me all the time, like two to three times a day, to ask about my day, say he missed me and wanted to chat. He started telling me private stuff about his life because he felt like he could talk to me since I was so mature for my age. I didn't like it so I stopped answering, or would make an excuse and quickly hang up. Then he would send me messages. That's when things started getting worse. The messages would vary in tone, sometimes they were really childish, with lots of emojis. He would wish me a lovely day or say he was thinking of me. Other times they would simply say, you're so pretty, too pretty, with no context. He would say he was glad I didn't have a boyfriend, that I should never get one or he would be mad. I never answered to those and showed them to Jasmine. I told her I didn't want to see or talk to him anymore before or after class and she said she would help. I started going to class late so I wouldn't meet him in the corridors. I leave class immediately after the end, but I saw him watching me. I could feel he knew what I was doing but actually sort of enjoyed it. I felt like it was a game to him, making me feel uncomfortable. He stopped talking to Jasmine and everyone else, but continued to message me saying, I miss you or why are you so busy? I blocked his number. I thought that would be the end of it and started relaxing a bit, but one day I was talking to another girl outside the school and he showed up with a big smile and said that it's been too long and why I wasn't answering his messages. He acted like he was worried about me, that I was studying too much, etc. He invited me to go have a coffee with him in his house. I told him no and went inside, where I pretended to study in the library until he left. He waited around doing nothing more for an hour. I started really being scared then. Since that day he invited me to his house, he became more aggressive, making fun of me whenever he bumped into each other in the corridor, saying stuff like, still busy or I'm in no hurry. He found my social medias and sent me messages there, each time more explicit. He would comment on my pictures saying I was sexy and that he knew what I was up to, teasing me. I blocked him everywhere but I always felt like he was watching me all the time. He stopped talking to me but would always stare at me in class. One day I was going back home alone after class. I noticed a car was right next to me, driving slowly and when I looked it was him. He talked to me through the window and invited me in, said he would give me a ride home. It was a residential street, not many people around. I said no and continued walking. He kept insisting and saying he knew where I lived he could drop me there. I started walking fast then, stopped interacting with him at all. I just wanted to get to the main road so there would be more people around. He got angry then, said get in in a voice I almost didn't recognize. I looked at him in shock and his facial expression had changed completely. He had a dark look in his eyes, no smile at all. He looked like he wanted to hurt me. So I ran and got into the first shop I saw, a mini market. I waited until his car left and then sped home. After that I didn't want to go back to class. I asked my mom to change classes. I never told her why, for some reason I felt ashamed, like I somehow caused the situation. I finished the semester without incidents and thought it was all over, but after two years, yes two whole years, he came back. By then I was starting university and any thoughts of him were out of my mind. Until he created a new account on Facebook and started messaging me again, like nothing happened, like no time had gone by. He said he was hurt I cut him out of my life, that he wanted to be my friend. I blocked every account he made without ever answering. One day to my panic he showed up in my campus. I went to a university that was close from home but still, it couldn't have been a coincidence. He was just across the street, watching me. I hurried and got into a bus before he could talk to me. The next week I wasn't so lucky. I was eating a snack at the cafeteria with a group of friends and he just suddenly came by and introduced himself to everyone, like we were old friends. I could barely breathe. My friends noticed I wasn't feeling well and he seemed to enjoy their confusion and my fear. I pulled him aside and asked him what he was doing, asked him to leave me alone. He said he wouldn't and again had that dark look he had in the car, years before. The creepiest part was just how different it was from the expression he had around everyone else. He looked like a different person. I told him I would tell everyone and he said he knew I wanted him. He knew I was just a dirty little tease but that he would get me. My body and mind just shut down when I heard that and I ran back to my friends and started crying. When I finished telling them everything he had gone away and I never saw him again. When I was 16, what feels like eons ago, I started going to high school that had a public library in it. Upon entering the front doors of the school, there was a wide hallway with the entrance to the library being a straight walk from the school entrance. So it wasn't like outsiders had to walk through the halls to get to it. 
but it really bothered me that anyone with a library card could be in our school at any given moment that it was open, even if they were only supposed to check out books or use a computer. Having said that, I rarely saw adults that weren't school employees in the library during school hours. My family didn't always have the electricity on, much less the internet, so I would often stay after school to do my homework in the library where I could use the computers. The librarian's desk was in the middle of the library and there were maybe two dozen computers off to one side, in four or five rows. Other than that, there were a few small rooms where the book club would meet or someone could study privately, which were locked up when not in use. One afternoon, I had a research essay to do. I think it was about Homer's Odyssey, so I had asked my dad to pick me up two hours after school ended. I went to the library immediately after my last class and chose a computer close to the librarian's desk. Blissfully, only the librarian and I were in the room. I was really pleased to be able to work quietly and started plugging in away at my assignment. 30 minutes into writing, I heard the doors of the library open. I didn't look up, but I could hear a man speaking boisterously to the librarian, with her responding in a very chummy way. They were talking like they knew each other very well. After a few minutes of chatting, the librarian excused herself. I can't remember if I heard her say why, but she bustled out of the room and did not return before I left more than an hour later, which hadn't happened before. I can't say for sure, but I'm almost positive that she was supposed to not leave the library unattended while it was open. They actually closed it when she took lunch sometimes because I'd seen the back in X minute sign on the door previously. Almost as soon as the librarian left, this adult man decided to use a computer. Being that we were the only two people using computers, you would think he sat nowhere near me, right? He sat one chair away from my right. I could see from the corner of my eye that he was a very large man in every sense of the word, but otherwise, he looked like your average guy with generic black frame glasses. After the first peripheral glance, I tried to avoid looking over at this guy. I also told myself that the librarian knew him, so he's probably okay. Just subdue checking his email. Nothing to be paranoid about. As I'm continuing to research for my essay and make notes, I start hearing this guy giggle in between clicking the mouse. At first quietly, but he starts chuckling within a minute. I didn't want to, but I felt my whole head turn to look at this guy's computer. His monitor was showing what appeared to be a photo covered by colorful jigsaw puzzle pieces. As the guy clicked on the puzzle piece outlines, they disappeared, revealing the picture underneath. When I first looked at it, the picture was completely visible except for two pieces. The image was a naked man posing with his arms over his head. The creep looked over at me, still chuckling. I had the feeling he was canvassing for my reaction, which was unmasked disgust. I logged off and moved to a different computer, which I thought sent the message that he may be uncomfortable. I logged into my new computer and as soon as I started typing, the guy got up, walked over, and sat down next to me. I promptly stood up, kicking over my chair, unplugged the computer, I wanted to log out really fast, and ran out. My dad wasn't going to be there for another 30 minutes, at least so I waited in the bathroom. Whenever it was about time for me to get picked up, I walked toward the front doors to leave the school, and I decided to peek in the library. The creep was sitting at the computer still, but his body was turned to face the doors and he was looking straight at me, with a big grin on his face. I dropped out of school that year, and this honestly played a part in that decision. I felt so vulnerable, and looking back I think that librarian might have been secretly creeped out by this guy and was playing nice in front of him. She might have made a lame excuse to leave the room so that she didn't have to entertain him, which I would understand if she wasn't leaving him alone with an underage student. I didn't trust the school to take it seriously, especially the librarian, so I didn't tell anyone. I just hope that guy isn't prowling around the high school still. Last year I, a 20 year old female, had taken the morning off from work so I could pick up my friend from a pretty serious medical procedure. It had been a tense time and I really just wanted her to get through it okay so she could begin to heal and feel better. I live in New York and her appointment was right off of 42nd Street by Grand Central Station, which is arguably one of the most well populated, busy areas of the city. I had just gotten off the subway and was walking east past Grand Central Station when I made eye contact with this dude walking towards me, and half a block away. He was a thin, looking guy with really creepy eyes, and he was looking basically directly into my soul. It was incredibly unsettling. We were far enough away that I tried to play it off, look down, and casually strafe to the right a bit so that our paths wouldn't cross. When I looked up, I noticed he mirrored my movement so our paths were directly aligned again. I strafed again to the left, and he again moved to be in line with me, eyes still locked on me. I felt a sick feeling in my stomach and started to freak out a little. He was getting much closer now and we were basically trapped in a group of people so I didn't really have space or time to cross the street. I also didn't want to turn around and go the opposite way because then my back would be towards him. I took my headphones out and kind of slowed down, but he was absolutely still coming for me. When he inevitably got close enough to me that we were within arm's reach of each other, I guess my fight or flight took over and I grabbed him by the shoulders and shoved him aside, sidestepping him. He was full on attempting to collide with me. The group of people around us barely reacted, which is crazy to me. 
I thought I dodged a bullet, except after shoving him out the way, he began screaming at me. I yelled back at him, what were you doing? Get out of here, you're creepy, keep moving. And other random phrases that just fell right in the moment. Deep down I think I was just hoping if I made a scene someone would step in to help, but nobody did, and then I noticed that he had stopped walking and had fully turned his body around to face me again, and then began to walk toward me again. He was yelling at me this time, calling me disgusting, crude names, telling me he was going to smack me and teach me a lesson, etc. I absolutely panicked and began jogging away, only to look back and realizing that he was now jogging after me, still threatening me and screaming at me. He was getting closer and all I could think was find a cop. You're at Grand Central. Where are the cops? Now one stranger noticed or intervened. He was literally 10 feet away from me when I finally just ran up to the biggest, burliest dude I could find and yelled help at him. He was a little surprised and didn't do much, but this younger couple next to us stepped in. The guy got in between us and started telling the creepy dude to get lost, that he's making a scene and that he needs to go, etc. While the girlfriend consoled me. The guy glared at me one last time until he finally turned and started walking away, still cursing. I thanked the couple and continued along my way, making it about 5 paces before absolutely breaking down in tears and calling a friend. Thank god for the coffee place nearby that let me loiter while I collected myself before going in to pick up my friend. And thank the universe for that brave couple that stepped in to protect me. To this day I wonder what the man would have done to me if I hadn't shoved him aside or if that couple hadn't stopped him from chasing me. Just goes to show, no matter how many people are around you, if you're having a bad feeling, listen to it. And don't be afraid to yell for help. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. To give you a little background about myself, I'm a female from a South Asian country. That being said, there are some states which are relatively safe. 2019 had been a rough year for me, but by October I started feeling rather better and decided to take a solo trip for my birthday. I spoke to some friends and decided to head to the small village down south. My brother helped convince my overprotective mother as he'd already been there. To put her mind at ease, I decided to get pepper spray. Unfortunately, we couldn't find one, so I kept a bottle of deodorant and a knife handy. I decided to stay there for 5 days and booked a room at a guest house only for 2 days, thinking I'll check out this guest house that my friend had suggested and hopefully move there. To tell you a little bit more about this village, everyone is extremely friendly and warm, and they have tourists coming from all over the globe. Once I got to the room, I was a little paranoid because it seemed a bit dingy. Forget about a security system, the latch on the door was barely functional. The first night was a bit unsettling, but nothing happened. The next day was my birthday, so I rented a bike and went on exploring the village. Sometime after lunch, I decided to check out the guest house that my friend had recommended which was a little secluded but extremely peaceful. As I reached there, I was greeted by the owner, who showed me around. This place had big huts on one side and a row of small rooms on the opposite side. I decided to take the latter as it was cheaper and I didn't plan on being in the room much anyway. We exchanged numbers and I told him I'll move in the next day. The next day, I got there and had lunch with the owner and he told me about the history of the place and a bit about himself. I realized that he wasn't around when my friend had been there. I was trying to read him, seeing if I was getting any creepy vibes from him since I was going to spend two nights there. I didn't see any red flags in particular. After lunch, I went to a restaurant that was right behind the guest house. I met some of the locals whom I was already acquainted with. Along with them were two new guys, one of whom was from my city. The three of us instantly clicked and started hanging out. Once it got dark, we came back to my guest house to chill. When the owner told us that he's planning a bonfire with some of his guests slash friends who were sitting at another table. An hour passed as we ate and played cards. But those guys didn't seem like they were in the mood for a bonfire and soon left the place. Since the owner had already set things up, we decided to spend some time by the fire with him. We were all sitting and talking up until midnight, when the other two boys decided to take off as they weren't staying there. I told the owner that I head back to my room too. He tried to convince me to stay a bit longer, but I didn't want to be alone with him. My room's door had around 4-5 to five locks, but only two of them were functional. So I locked them and realized that the windows facing each other did not have any panes and the curtains were made with scraps of thin cloth, which meant anyone could peep inside and see everything, so I went into the bathroom to change and clean up. As soon as I stepped out and started taking my stuff from my bag, I heard someone whisper my name, twice. My heart skipped a beat and I froze for a few seconds. I decided to ignore it and quickly shut all the lights. Before going to bed, I decided to keep the bin right in front of the door, so in case someone tries to open it, it would make some noise. I took out my deodorant and knife and kept it right next to my pillow before laying in bed. I kept looking at both the windows on the side to see if anyone's outside. After about half an hour, the metallic door started rattling violently, as if someone was trying to force it open. Instantly, I stood up and got hold of the knife and deodorant. My mouth went dry and my heart started beating fast. I didn't know if I should scream because I only knew of one other girl who was staying in the opposite hut. 
After what felt like forever, the door stopped shaking and I collapsed into the bed. I checked the windows to see if anyone was walking by, but no one did. I tried to think of what it could have been. Maybe it was just the wind, but the currents hadn't moved one bit. It had to be a person. I don't know when, but I passed out soon after. I woke up around 6am to see that it was almost bright outside. I closed my eyes and tried to go back to sleep, when it started happening again. Frantically, I shut up in bed again, ready to attack. But once again, it stopped after a few minutes. I didn't understand what was happening. I went closer to the door and got a look at the bin that I had kept by the door. It had moved away from its original position. Yes, something definitely happened. Not knowing what to do, I decided to go back to sleep. When I got out of the room later, I tried to read the owner's face, but it was just as hard to read as the day before. What worried me the most was that I had to spend another night in that room. I decided to not let that thought spoil the day and went out with the two friends I'd made for a trek and then to watch the sunset from a hilltop, where all the locals gathered to play music in the evening, including that owner. My new friends and I went somewhere else after that and then around 10 decided to head back to my guest house for dinner. As I was nearing the hotel, I got a text from the owner, asking where I was. I didn't think much of it because it was late and he was probably wondering if I was safe. I didn't reply as we were almost there. When we sat down on the futon, the owner said I was just about to text you and show me the message he typed on his phone. I was just thinking about you. I'm not sure what that meant. So I looked at his face trying to read him and realized he was trying to do the same. Quickly I decided to act normal and told him where we were. We all sat, met a couple more people, ate, smoked, and around 11, the guys decided to head to their guest houses. At that point I got up and told him I'd head to my room too. He looked at the time and asked me why I was ending the night so early. I told him that I was really tired from all that walking and that I wanted to be up early. He didn't push any further as there were other people around. I went back to the room filled with anticipation and dread, but thankfully nothing happened that night. The next day I checked out, but my bus wasn't until 5pm. I didn't want to be left alone with the owner, so I met up with the guys, leaving my luggage at the reception which was also the eating area. When I came back, I picked up my bag and thanked him and left in a hurry. I still have no idea if it was the owner or the only helper that I saw around. Whoever it was trying to forcefully get through my door, let's not me. I may have been 8-9 to nine years old. I lived in a nice little middle class neighborhood. One of my best friends, Raven, lived across the street diagonally, one house down, so I often spent evenings at her home after school. Raven's mom would always call my mom to let her know I was leaving and to expect me in the next minute or so. This way mom knew to unlock our front door. Often she stood and watched from the screen door to make sure I got across okay. I had begun noticing this beat up red car, possibly an old Volkswagen or Buick, that would pass by almost every night as I ran back across the street. I would always head home just after dark, so possibly around 8.30 any time I was leaving Raven's house. It was always rolling super slow, speed limit was 25 miles per hour, and I want to say this vehicle was always passed at maybe half that. One night as I was leaving perhaps a bit later than usual, I stepped out the side door of Raven's house just as the car was about to pass the house completely. It stopped in the road and backed up as I approached the side of the road. The window rolled down just as the car stopped in front of me. A little woman with short reddish brown hair and blue framed glasses was smiling sweetly at me. Hi sweetheart, it's a little late for you to be out right now, isn't it? She asked me, her voice was low and pleasant. No, mom lets me, I'm just walking home, I replied stupidly. Oh gosh, how silly of your mom. There's all kinds of bad people out late at night. Where do you live, sugar? I'll give you a ride. Just then, my mom came bursting out the front door and screamed, leave her alone, as she began running to me. The woman's pleasant demeanor dropped and I heard her mutter a word, possibly f as she slammed her foot on the gas and took off at well over the speed limit. She didn't stop at the nearby stop sign, just blasted through it to make her escape. I got a nice lecture that night but also a lot of tight hugs. My mom was super glad that she chose to look out the storm door to check on me instead of just letting me wander home. I could have been taken, and she told me as much. I cannot remember if the police were called, but I never interacted with any officers. This doesn't end here though. Like most little kids, I really liked setting up lemonade stands. Like most little kids, I also enjoyed hand making and baking cakes and browners and cookies, and also selling those at my lemonade stands. About two weeks after the prior incident, a beautiful sunny Saturday, mom helped me with the baking and helped me make lemonade and set me up in the front yard with my sign. She had been paranoid ever since the prior incident and had hardly let me out of her sight aside from school and the bus, and this was no different. She stayed outside with me all while I sold my little treats to passerby, until she had to run to the restroom. It would obviously be a pain to take everything down and bring it inside while she went and then to bring it all back out and set it up again. She figured I'd be okay for a few minutes, considering it was the middle of the afternoon and usually kidnappers aren't that stupid. Mom left me alone for several minutes when she went to the bathroom and presumably went to grab a snack as she was gone for 10 or so minutes. 
A familiar face walked up, about 8 minutes in. She appeared from around some bushes down the street. I didn't see her the distance walking up. I honestly saw her stand up from behind some bushes and brush herself off and begin walking towards me. Her clothes were smart and sophisticated looking, almost like a pantsuit. It was a real clash with how ratty her car had been, but that same placating smile was on her face and her eyes glinted behind the same glasses. Aw cute, a lemonade stand. Hi again sweetie, sorry for bothering you the other night. I didn't realize how close to home you were. Mama told me to not talk to you, go away. I said it as meanly as I could muster, but mom had rightfully and made me so frightened of this woman that I'm sure I just sounded like the scared little girl I was. Come on now, Mary. She spoke my real name, first and last, and my eyes got big. I'm a friend of your parents. I lived on the street, remember? We met at the pool this past summer. I had no recollection of her. If you're their friend, why did you leave so quick? Mom, I began shouting for my mother. This made her crouch down in front of my table, eye to eye with me. We don't need to do that. I just want to talk to you. You like to bake, right? I have a really fancy kitchen with a nice baker's oven. All sorts of cool gadgets to make baking cupcakes and stuff like this super fun. No, 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 mama. I stood up and pushed the table into this woman and started running for the front door. This woman kicked the folding table away and started to chase me until my mom appeared in the doorway. She flung the door open and I barreled into her and the woman stopped running and stood in the yard. What are you doing to my daughter? My mom shouted at her. My god, your child is rude. I was just trying to buy a cupcake and she shoved the table into me and ran. Now I have lemonade all over my clothes. The woman lied through her teeth. I don't think she was expecting my mom to come back. That's the lady from that night, in the car. I was now trying to get around my mom and hide behind her. My mom pulled out her cell phone and this time I know she called the police. The woman immediately ran off back the direction she came. The cops appeared, one took statements while the other one patrolled the neighborhood searching for her. They ended up finding her car parked at the grocery store that was up the road about half a mile at the other end of the neighborhood. They waited for her to show up and claim it. She never did. They couldn't find her. So, random lady in the red beater, please, let's not meet again. This happened a couple years ago when I was 16. I had just recently got my first job at a chain sandwich shop. It was located in the shopping mall outlet at the far end. There were quite a few businesses around it, including a restaurant down the way and a super target on the other side of the mall on the far end of the parking lot. My parents were always super protective and taught me at a young age to be aware of my surroundings and protect myself, and rarely even let me walk alone to begin with. On this particular day, I had left my phone at home because I wasn't allowed to have it at work and had a daily time limit on it anyways. Thanks mom. I had ended up finishing up my shift early, and my mom was still shopping at the Target, so told me to go ahead and walk over to meet her. I began walking towards the Target and had to wait for passing cars. One silver car stopped and let me walk across. I smiled and waved thank you and the man in the car did the same and turned on the street going the direction I was walking. I didn't think anything of it, as it was a relatively busy parking lot and most of the shops are over on the other side by the target. A minute or two goes by and I spot the same car now driving in the opposite direction towards me. I make a mental note but think I'm just overreacting. That is, until he turns back around. At this point I'm concerned and notice I'm now a part of the mall that's a little less crowded with a more empty parking lot. I get this uneasy feeling in my stomach that he's following me, and to test my hypothesis, I switch my direction. Instead of heading towards the target, I walk towards the restaurant. The car immediately turns into the parking lot. I switch into freakout mode and speed walk to the front doors. In my time of panic, I didn't realize that the parking spots for the restaurant were completely empty. I pull on the doors and they're locked. They were apparently closed on Sundays. At this point, the man in the gray car was parked in the lot in front of the restaurant watching me. The way he was parked, I would have to pass this car to go back on the path I originally was on. I stand there a moment pretending not to notice and think about what to do next. I obviously don't want to walk any closer to the car than I already was. I decide to cut through the side shrubbery of the restaurant and head towards the closest shop I could find. The gray car comes out of the parking lot still following me and I bolt into the dollar store across from the restaurant. I see the gray car park and I walk up to one of the cashiers and explain what happened and I ask if I could use her phone to speak to my mother. She says of course and tells me to stay in here until my mom comes to get me. I call my mom and tell her about the car and she of course freaks out. By this time, I think the man in the car caught on because he eventually backs out and leaves. My mom shows up and thanks the cashier lady and we drive to the Target. Aside from us both being shaken up, we were okay. It definitely ruined me for walking alone again. Now that I'm an adult and live on my own, I carry pepper spray and a pocket knife anywhere I go just in case. I rarely walk anywhere unless I'm with someone or it's only a few minutes away. It still scares me today to think of what could have happened, or what that man's intentions were. So, to the man in the gray car, let's not meet again. This all happened last summer when me and my childhood best friend, we were both 15, decided to go camping for her birthday. We were originally supposed to be a 5-6 to six person group, but it ended up being just the two of us. 
So we met at her grandma's house, me with my scooter and her with her mom in a car and headed to our camping site for the next two nights. The camping site was very deep in the woods beside a public trail, but there were still neighbors who had a lot right next to the one we were using. My friend's mother warned us to not go take a walk on the left side of the trail, which would lead us to the weird and possibly dangerous neighbors. We obviously listened since we didn't want any trouble at all. So after unpacking most of our stuff, her mother left, letting us alone in the middle of the woods with only a 50cc scooter to get out in case of emergency which, don't get me wrong, is very useful but not very fast. So we started doing our thing, eating junk food, listening to music, catching up on both of our lives, since we haven't talked in a very long time. She moved away a few years prior to this so we don't get the chance to talk to each other that much. The sun was slowly going down, it was getting darker and darker. We were talking and singing when we heard an ATV coming on the trail. It was coming from the left side. Me and my friend freaked out a little so we basically just locked the door and ran to the back of the camper. The ATV stopped on our camping site. We could hear two adult males talking to each other about whatever knows what. It took something like 5 minutes but they finally left. At this point we weren't that worried because we thought it was just some curious people who wanted to know if there was anyone in the camper, which had already been robbed in the past, so we just continued our stuff, listening to music and all. By this time it was already dark outside and the moon wasn't out yet, leaving us with no other lights than our candle. There was no water and no electricity in the camper, which also meant we had to go outside to use the bathroom. Fortunately, it was a full moon night so eventually the moon would come out and we will be able to see outside pretty well. So again we were talking, everything else was quiet, no music, no animal noises either, and then we heard an ATV coming our way once again so we turned out all the candles and stopped talking, waiting in silence. We quickly sat on the ground of the camper to make sure no one could see us from outside because the curtains were still opened and then we listened. The ATV stopped a little before coming up to our camping site and everything went silent. A couple minutes after that we could hear footsteps all around the camper. Yes, it could have been an animal, but with the ATV sound and what happened after, we know it wasn't an animal. The steps eventually faded away. We then quietly moved to the back of the camper, closing every curtain, making sure the door was locked. We brought two knives with us. We eventually heard another noise. We immediately went silent and we hid the candlelight. We then heard the noise again. It was like someone was trying to open the camper door just by turning the handle. We then heard footsteps going all the way around the camper and we could hear the person testing every single window to see if any of them were opened. We were almost crying. After they tested all the windows, the steps faded away with maybe one hour of tranquility and silence during which we were quite panicking. When we finally calmed down, we heard noises at the door once again, but this time, it sounded more like someone was trying to unlock the door with the lockpick. We could hear the lockpick inside of the mechanism and then the person would try to turn the handle. After 5 minutes of trying, the person probably got mad and started turning the handle angrily and punching and kicking at the door. We were freaked out. I had my brand new iPhone in one hand, hesitating on calling the cops or no. No service was available at this location, but 911 can still work most of the time. The noise was still going on at the door and all around the camper. This lasted for at least 30 minutes. The person was trying every window and then at some point gave up once again. We then started to make up a plan. The noise at the door happened a couple more times. We acted as if we were more than two people in the camper, so we started acting like my friend's mother and sister were there, as if one of our guy friends was there, and we acted like the noise woke us up and we screamed at the people to go away and we got mad. Our plan worked, I guess, since we heard multiple people running away. The next morning after making sure everything was okay, we got out of the camper and we saw that a bunch of the plants next to the camper had been stepped on. There were footsteps everywhere in the mud and everywhere around the camper. Since it was daytime and my friend's mother was supposed to come back to see us, to make sure we were okay, we decided to sit outside waiting for her. We were walking around waiting when a car slowed down in front of our campsite. It never stopped but we saw the driver staring at us. Then maybe 10 minutes later it went by again and again and again, always giving us that menacing stare. When my friend's mother finally arrived, we asked her if anyone tried to prank us or make a joke and she went on and asked every possible suspect and no it was not a prank. Everyone promised that if it was them, they would have told us but it really wasn't them. We didn't sleep alone this time. We had someone else come sleep with us for the second night. I'm just glad they weren't able to open the door to the camper. So I'm 23 now but when this happened I was 17. In my last year of high school I was the art girl. I was working on my portfolio so that I could apply to art school. I mainly did landscapes but part of the requirement for our portfolios was life drawing. Obviously my high school didn't have any life drawing classes so my art teacher linked me up to a life drawing class at a local university which is one of the top art institutions in the UK. So for my school I had to get a half hour bus to the center of the city. 
and then walk maybe 15 minutes of a long stretch through the student district. It was a six week course and this happened the fifth week. The class was really interesting and I learned a lot since this was my first time working with life models. I was pretty confident and not too worried about walking alone at night. The class finished at maybe 9pm and it was pretty dark by the time I got out. So 4 weeks walking there and back, uneventful. 5th week walking there, totally fine. 5th week walking back to my bus stop, also totally fine. 5 minutes of the bus stop, it was very freaky. So the stop I had to wait at was outside the expensive private school in my city. There's a strip with about 4 bus stops and it's also pretty busy. So busy that people don't even see what's happening right in front of them. So I must have been one of the first people there so I'm standing just outside the shelter because I'm smoking and obviously I don't want to be a jerk and make other people breathe in my smoke. So there's only about a few minutes left to my bus and I'm minding my business when this guy comes and stands super close to me. Like not as in infringing a bit of my personal space here close. Like, literally, I can feel him standing against me. He must have been in his 40s and just had that general creepy vibe and looked really grubby. So obviously, I'm a bit freaked out and sidestep away. So does he. I look at him and he has the creepiest smug grin. By this point, I'm like, okay, he's trying to freak me out and he knows I know. I step away again, like fairly far away this time. He follows me again and is literally standing with the front of his body dead up against the back of mine. Honestly, I do not know how nobody noticed this or called him out. We were outside the shelter and it was dark. People are on their phones or their own conversations. I guess it must have been just that. I literally just froze in the moment, even though there were people around who would have helped. I don't want to overreact, maybe it's just a misunderstanding. I don't want to seem rude. So anyway, it gets worse. After dodging this creep for a few more moments as time dragged in slow, finally this bus comes around the corner. I know if I get on this bus before this guy, he is going to sit next to me which is what I want to avoid. So politely I gesture and say after you. He gives me that creepy look again and says no, you go first. I insist but he refuses again. There's a big queue now and I don't want to hold anyone up, so reluctantly, I get on right before this guy. I get on the bus and do the only reasonable thing which is to sit next to an old lady right at the front of this empty bus. The seats are only in pairs so there's no way he could sit beside me now. Like I said, this bus is almost empty, so where does he sit? In the seat directly behind me. I'm just sitting trying to ignore him, which is pretty difficult to do when this guy keeps leaning forward and literally playing with my hair. I have really long hair and his hands are on it. I pulled out my phone and tried to text my mom but the sending bar would just stick. It happened to literally every time I tried to message her. Obviously I was scared to call her, I didn't want him hearing what I had to say. I messaged my friend and told her what was happening and that I thought that if I got off this bus the guy would most definitely follow me. I still had a 10 minute walk home after I got off this bus up a long straight road. So my friend calls my mom and tells her what's happening. My mom then calls me and relays what my friend had told her. Now, I'd been on this bus for about 15 to 20 minutes and my stop was coming up in 5. It's not a big city. My area is suburban and I don't know everyone but I think I recognize most. i never seen this guy before. He wasn't local to my area so I reasoned he had definitely been on this bus longer than a stop. Anyway, my mom called. I just said to her, I will be getting off this bus in 5 to 10 minutes. You need to get to X Street now and meet me. As soon as I said that, the creep pushes the button for the next stop. Literally as soon as I say it. He stands up and makes sure to bang into my arm and drag his body hard across me as he walks past. Stares at me from the door and through the window as the bus drives away. I'm not 100% certain if he actually had bad intentions or if he just got off on a 17 year old girl who was on her own. The fact he pressed the button as soon as I confirmed someone was meeting me makes me think he did intend on following me. I didn't go to the final week of that class. This happened this past year, my senior year of undergrad. I attend a big university with two bus stops. The first one is for a smaller portion of the school and the second one is the main one that people use, but they're pretty far apart. I got out of class and was next to the small bus stop around sunset. This guy, I'll call him Eric, comes up to me of all people in line and starts asking if this bus would take him to one of the student housing areas. It was kind of odd because it was part way into the year, but whatever, he seemed genuinely confused. I explained yes, this bus would take him there and his stop is the same one I get off of. He asked if he can wait in line with me and he was nice so I said sure. We're talking and waiting for the bus and it doesn't come so I decide to walk to the main stop and he follows. Again, at this point it's not creepy because it's just small talk. We walk to the other bus stop and we just jump on one over there. Eric sits next to me and is berating me with questions that I'm now answering very shortly. Then everything he says is flirty, like, yeah, come see my pool so we can tan. Let's work out together and get sweaty in the sauna. All very weird and random and I just don't say much because everyone on the bus can hear the conversation. 
He then asks for my number, which I lie about, but this guy says okay let me call you. Obviously, I get a call and Eric's just confused and I just say oh my bad. I knew he would call it again so I just gave the right number. Now I'm regretting telling him I stop, but I still get off with him. He's continuing the flirty comments but the street I'm parked on is opposite of his route home. I say goodbye and wait till he's out of my sight and to get in my car and drive away. At this point it's late and he was gone so I just went home and forgot about it. He texted me a couple times the next few weeks, all of which I ignored. Eventually he stopped and I forgot about the encounter. Fast forward a few months and I rarely use the bus anymore because I have a parking pass. One day after class I decided to go to the Vons right next to my original bus stop. I park on the farthest road because it's very busy and my car is in the middle of the row. I'm on a quick mission so I'm rushing down the first aisle and some guy turns around to check me out but I ignore it and keep going. I felt the guy's eyes on me still and thought how do I know this dude? Then I get in line and there he is at the front of the line grinning at me. It's Eric from the bus and I'm like screw this, so I switch lines. He checks out way before I do and leaves. I get my stuff and walk out to my car. I was parked just far enough that you couldn't see my car, just the direction it was in. As I get closer, there's Eric standing right in front of my car. This was disturbing because he wasn't waiting at the door of the store or in the middle of the lot. Nope, right at my car. He positions himself in between me and my car and he's grinning and he says, I know you. I played dumb saying sorry you must have me confused. He says no you're from school. I say no that's not me, I don't go to that school. He believes me and starts aggressively asking me out. I say no thank you, I have a boyfriend. He says okay so you can't have friends? And I look at him and say sarcastically, do you really want to just be friends? He just grins at me and replies no. He then says, don't worry, when you're single I will find you. The way he said it was very unnatural and creepy. He finally gets out of my way and lets me into my car. He watches me leave the parking lot and I drove to my brother's house just because of how unsettling that encounter was. On one occasion, I came from a group project and had to take the bus. It was crowded when I got on so I sat in the first seat I saw. I could hear the conversation behind me and instantly recognize Eric's voice. The girl he was talking to seemed to be really into the conversation surprisingly. But now here I was on a bus to a school that I told this creep I didn't go to. I tried to get off quickly but somehow Eric and the girl got off before me. I'm relieved and try to keep a distance. I don't see them anymore and turn a corner and there he is again waiting for me. He doesn't move though, he just grins at me and says, Hi, are you going that way or this way by now? He used my real name and the fake one I used when I played dumb at Bonds. I just walk away and call my friends to meet on campus. The shelter in place was issued the next week and I moved home. Luckily I never have to see Eric again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story is from my days as a gas station clerk. This happened during a football Saturday so the store was full of people from the moment I walked in. Most of the night is a blur because it was just cashiering for the first 6 hours of my shift. It was around 3am and things were finally starting to taper off. There were only a dozen or so people in the store. I just usually kept my head down and focused on the transaction in front of me so I wouldn't get overwhelmed. Only looking up now and then to make sure the store isn't on fire and no one's stealing the wine case. I wasn't even looking around when I saw him just saw something strange in the corner of my eye and spun my head to look at him. When I got a good look, I was startled. This guy's skin was almost translucent white and he was soaking wet. His teeth were gritted and looked too big for his mouth. He was shaking as fast as he walked past the counter. I could hear the bathroom door slam from around the corner. I went back to my transaction and told myself that I needed to remember exactly where he was. I couldn't forget he was in the bathroom. I rang out the next few people, watching for him the whole time. After another 10 minutes or so, the store was suddenly empty. Customer rushes tend to be like that, from 100 miles an hour to just nothing. I knew he was still in the bathroom. I thought about going to knock, but I felt repelled. I had no intention of going near that door. I look at the clock and it's nearing 4am, which is when I need to start brewing coffee for it to be ready when my manager comes in. The coffee grounds are all in the supply closet behind the counter, so I tell myself it's totally fine to go get them. It satisfies both my paranoia and my arrogance as well. I'm still doing my job, but doing something I believe to be tactically the best move. If for whatever reason the guy opened the bathroom door and tried to run behind the counter and do something to me, I could shut the door and lock it from the inside. Besides, the bathroom doors are old and loud. I can easily hear them open from inside the closet, so I can just come out and wait near the panic button until he leaves. This all seemed like a very good idea at the time. So I decide to go get the coffee packets and I'm listening carefully while I load up on all the flavors I need. I figure I will only be a minute or so so I don't even turn the lights on. I'm listening carefully and I don't hear anything. I still don't hear anything. 
Then I hear a weird noise. It sounds like the water pipes in the back hissing at first, but it's too ragged. I suddenly realize the noise is breathing, and it's getting louder. Then it's right on top of me. That's when I stood and turned to leave, and saw him in the doorframe. We just stood there both staring back at each other. Later when my manager reviewed the footage, she saw him leave the bathroom by slowly pushing the door open. Without making a sound, he had wandered behind the counter and peeked into her office, stepping in far enough to trigger the automatic light. After that, he had wandered behind the food surface counter before making his way to the open supply closet door. The next thing she saw on camera was me flipping out. I stepped backwards, my body shaking so hard my knees almost buckled. At this point, I think he realized how absolutely horrifying this entire scenario was to me. He put up his hands and started apologizing awkwardly. He was really twitchy and still gritting his teeth. I basically went on autopilot for a moment and said I wouldn't talk to him until he got out from behind the counter area. He walked backwards until he was barely on the other side of the employee's only entrance, standing next to the soda machine. He began asking for an iPhone charger, telling me he was lost. He said he had no money and just needed to charge his phone here until he could call for help. I told him I don't have an iPhone charger and I couldn't help him. He sighed and looked down for a moment, seeming to think about what to do. Then he flipped his head back and screamed as loud as he could. He then punched the soda machine, hard. I backed up and ran around the counter, up to where the panic button was under the register. I watched him as he walked around the store, punching the walls and kicking the counters and screaming. I heard myself shouting over and over, get out right now. After a second he stopped and turned around to look at me. He quietly apologized before wandering out of the store and running off into the dark. At this point I was shaking, but tried to pick up and keep working. I started brewing the coffee, checking the windows to see if he was out in the parking lot, but I couldn't see him. After another few minutes, a regular came in and told me a strange man had come up to him asking for a ride. He said the guy was soaked and his teeth were gritting. That's when I decided to call the police. They found him in the parking lot next door, screaming and punching the moving trucks. They took him to sober up and calm down. They informed me that he was very sorry for losing his cool and he was just very drunk and very lost. He had come from out of state for the game and got separated from his friends. In the end nothing bad happened, but it made me realize that something easily could have. My skin still crawls thinking about this guy. He saw me shopping for school supplies and things for my new apartment one evening during my first week of grad school and decided I was his mark. I had just moved to my new college town, didn't even have a cell phone yet after leaving the one my folks paid for during undergrad behind. As I left the parking lot with my purchases, I noticed this truck pull up behind me at the exit. It was late and there weren't too many people out. I pulled out and so did he. It was a few miles down a long retail street with lots of stoplights before my turn. As I drove, I realized the guy in the truck was trying to get my attention. Over the next few miles, he kept trying to get me to look at him. Some red lights he would end up ahead of me, some behind or beside. At every light he positioned himself so he could stare at me, either directly or in one of his mirrors. His gaze was unwavering and my anxiety rose. He was driving oddly, speeding up close to my bumper, hitting his brakes when he was in front of me, swerving close to my car a couple of times. Finally, at a red light where he was beside me, I glanced over and absolutely started to panic when I was met with an unbelievably empty, unwavering stare. He saw that I was terrified and he was following me, and he was trying to force me to pull over. At one point I scooted through an intersection on a hard yellow a couple of cars ahead of him thinking I could shake him. Nope. He went around the cars to the light and ran the red and got back in front of me. A freeway entrance ramp came up and I tried to fake him out by putting on my signal and getting into the merge lane for it. He took the bait and started up the ramp. I quickly got out of the merge lane and continued straight. Again, I'd hoped to lose him but he drove his truck down the embankment to keep following. At another light where he was beside me, I pulled through the light and then he turned at the last possible second. He made a u-turn and ran another red to follow me. My panic really ramped up at that point, with no cell phone, no sense of direction, and a new city. I really didn't know what to do, so I turned on some music and forced myself to sing along and forced myself to go to the speed limit so I wouldn't crash out of terrified stupidity. I decided to drive to the supermarket across town because I remembered it had a police station in it. He followed me all the way there. He burned out of the lot as soon as he saw all the cop cruisers parked out front. I filed a report and asked for a police escort home. I insisted because something told me this creep was waiting for me to leave the police station. He was. As soon as I pulled out, I saw him. I pulled over and told the officer following me and he went after him but the truck had taken off and the cop couldn't catch him. The police got the surveillance video from the first door. It turned out this jerk had been dodging me the entire time I was shopping. I saw my surveillance footage following me through the store. I saw him follow me out, close enough to grab my elbow. I saw footage of him circling the lot in his truck, waiting for me to pull out when I took too long to unload my cart. 
my heart sank. I was able to remember six of seven digits of his plate and the make and model of his truck. In the end, the cops did nothing. They said it was a he said she said since the surveillance video didn't catch him doing anything particular unlawful and was a losing case to try to charge him with anything. I ended up trading vehicles with a friend for a couple of months to try to feel safer and went on with my life. I had no idea what this guy did just a handful of months later until almost 15 years had passed. I was watching a Discovery ID show about the kidnapping and murder of Sandy Jeffers. I almost fell out of my seat when I saw the mugshot of her killer, Aaron Lee Skeen. It was him. I was so disgusted the law enforcement did nothing in my case that I tracked down the investigator in the murder case and, after verifying some things about his vehicle that were changed in the TV reenactment to weed out people making stuff up, she took my contact info and official statement. She could neither confirm nor deny that my run-in was with Skeen, but qualified her statement by saying at least you don't have to worry about him anymore because he got life without parole. I only wish something could have been done when he terrorized me. Perhaps things would have been different for Sandy. So yeah, creepy murderous stalker crazy dude, let's not ever meet again. I go for a short run every night, right after sundown, when it's finally cool out. I always take the exact same route, a loop through a quiet and sparsely populated neighborhood. And now I realize how easy of a target that's made me. A short section of the route passes by an unlit park. A couple of weeks ago, I'd seen a guy hanging out behind a truck that was parked next to the entrance, and it was so unusual to see someone else up there that I decided to be extra cautious, turn around, and head back home. I didn't get close enough to get a good look at his face. A few days later, I saw what looked like the same guy by the park again. I figured I was probably just being paranoid, but I decided to turn around again just in case. I hadn't noticed any activity by the park in the last several days, so I resumed my normal route and didn't even think about the guy I'd seen up there. Then last night, as I was passing by the park, I had this inexplicable feeling that I was being watched. I couldn't spot anyone nearby, but the park extends into pitch black darkness, so someone could easily hide there unseen. I decided to just keep running, look confident, and try to hurry past the park as quickly as I could. Suddenly, I smelled a strong wave of cologne in the air that immediately put me on edge, and I'm pretty grateful he was wearing it so it tips me off. After I smelled it, I had no doubt in my mind that there was somebody nearby, but still, I didn't see any movements in front or on either side of me, and I was afraid to turn around. Immediately past the park, there's a bend in the road. There's a house on the corner as you turn down the road. The house has lots of tall bushes in the front yard. I normally run right past those without even thinking of it, but since my gut instinct was blaring like a siren, I quickly moved to the middle of the street as I rounded the corner. I shot a glance behind me to see if anyone had actually been nearby. I saw a man slowly walking through the front yard of the house on the corner, looking towards me. He paused behind the bushes, as if trying to remain hidden. I could see his jeans and a pair of black white sneakers, but little else. His slow footsteps were so creepy that I can't get the image out of my mind, as if he was trying to be quiet as he could. If I hadn't made the split decision to run into the middle of the street and away from the yard, I would have been within grabbing distance. I turned on the flashlight on my phone, aimed it right at the bushes hoping it'd startle or blind long enough for me to get some distance between us, and started sprinting at full speed down the road. It was probably the fastest I've run in my life. At the end of each block, I glanced behind me to check if the man was there. Fortunately, I lost sight of him. If he decided to sprint after me, I'm not sure what I would have done. From what I could make out, this guy was at least a foot taller than me. By the time I got home, the adrenaline had dissipated and I was shaking with fear. I couldn't sleep at all that night. What scares me most about the whole thing is that I'm 99% sure this was the same guy I'd seen hanging out in front of the park recently, and now I can't shake the idea that he'd been watching me and calculating the right time and path to try to sneak up behind me. He knew that I always ran past there around the same time. I thought that he was probably watching me from the darkness in the park last night before quietly moving out of it and starting to follow me makes me sick. Needless to say, I won't be running past the park at night anymore, or running alone at night, period. The terror I felt when I turned around and saw the guy's shoes slowly moving behind the bushes and his head facing me is like nothing else I've felt before. I live in a small town, the kind where almost everyone knows each other, and it also really creeps me out to think that this might have been someone I've seen around town in the past. Part of me wishes I could have gotten a better look at his face for the police report. So this encounter took place approximately 10 years ago when I was 15. I was from a suburban area where my part of town was divided into a grid, approximately 8 blocks long and 8 blocks wide. Me and my friend Jesse were walking home from another friend's house who lives on almost the exact opposite of corner of the development from me. We were on the way home and as usual I walked him to his house and then walked to mine. We noticed a blue Ford Bronco was circling the blocks throughout our walk, but didn't really think anything of it. 
We got to his house and we hadn't seen the truck for a few blocks. I assumed I had nothing to worry about. I get another two blocks or so and I see the truck again. He was parked on the side of the road, but you could hear that his truck was still running. He followed me all the way home, but was sure to not take the exact same route. I got to my front porch and could see he's parked just a few houses down on the same side of the street. I mentioned it to my dad, an absolute mammoth of a man, and he went out to see the truck. He saw it and started walking down to it when it took off. Two weeks go by and I haven't seen the Bronco since. This walk home was almost a daily routine at this point. We had a snow day from school and just me and my sister were home. I'm playing on the computer when something catches my eye. Directly to my right is a window and there's a man standing in it. Now this window is on the first floor, but still approximately five and a half feet off the ground, by level house. This man's entire head and body still fit the window. He's got curly hair, a full beard, and looks to be pretty big as he fills almost the whole window. We locked eyes and I ran out to confront him, I know, stupid. He ran off down the street to the same blue Bronco parked in almost the same spot as last time. He pulled off faster than I could catch him. This time I called the cops. I gave them as much information as I could, and basically all they said was they'd keep an eye out for him. I showed them where he was, and they were able to confirm it by the footprints in the snow leading to and away from the window. Now what had me a bit concerned was I wore a size 12 shoe. My dad, who was still significantly larger than me at this point, wore a 14 and his shoes were still a bit smaller than the imprints in the snow. Well then, we're screwing with Bigfoot now. A few weeks go by and there hasn't been any more weird encounters. My head's been on a swivel every time I'm out of the house. I don't want to say that I was looking for a problem at this point, but I was. I was kind of hoping that this dude would show up and try something. I was ready for it. I wasn't ready. Me and Jesse were walking home from the same friend's house one night and we saw this Bronco again. Screw it. We're young and stupid dudes, so we figure we're going to trap him. We went completely out of our way to go to the only dead end in the development to try to get to him once we confirmed he was following us. You never know it was a dead end unless you knew the area because there were never and still aren't any dead end or no outlet signs. I guess he had an idea to what we were doing because he knew where we both lived. He didn't follow us down. We thought it was the perfect plan because of how many moves he'd have to make to turn around. Several cars parked on the street and it's not a cul-de-sac just a row with no outlet and thought we could run up on him when he tried to back out. He outsmarted us that day. The next day on the same trip from the same friend's house on the same road we see him again. I walk my friend home and figure screw it, I'm fine. I dare this dude to come out at me, and he didn't. This happened several more times over the next week or two, until the guy decided to make his move. I was on my way home after just leaving Jesse at his house. I got another block before I saw the truck. I'm walking perpendicular to his truck when as soon as I'm in his path, he turns on his lights. I ran up the few blocks to my house and waited on the porch to see where he was and what he was doing. This time he stayed put just a few houses down. I told my dad again and he went out to see. Truck's still there. Me and my dad start walking down to the truck and it's still not moving. This ballsy dude had the audacity to get out of his truck to confront us. Terrible idea. He gets out when my dad is still 25 feet from the truck. I guess my dad is about 6 foot 4 and under 300 pounds with a body built by Bud Light and manual labor. This guy though had some size on him. What I saw next was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life. So my dad's not much of a talker, and at this point he's already got a problem with this guy. The guy gets out of his truck with the most sadistic smile on his face. My first thought is the guy has a gun. I yelled to my dad that he might have a gun, and all he yelled back was, I got it. Well, he definitely had it. They walked up to each other, and before a word was even said, my dad swung. The dude was done in. Before he even started to crumple, my dad hit him again. He hit his truck and hit the ground. I never saw the guy again, and after just moving back into my parents' old house with my young son, I hope I never do. So big dude with the blue Ford Bronco, I hope you never come back to my window. So this happened about 14 years ago. I was 21, and it was the days of MySpace. I never used my real name online, it was in the mode of constantly posting pictures of me smoking, etc, so yeah. I happened to work at a local sandwich shop, and upon taking an order from a customer, I hear, hey, aren't you, enter my MySpace name. To which I asked why, of course, and he proceeded to tell me his MySpace name and I realized we have randomly commented on mutual friends' pages. Okay, whatever. He and his friends sit in the dining area and eat their lunch, but before leaving he came back to the counter. I thought he wanted a refill on his drink, so I went to the counter to ask him what he would like. Would you like to get drinks with me sometime? I was a little surprised, but fresh out of a bad breakup and was ready to date, so I said sure, why not? I told him to message me online later and we could work it out. Cut to two days later, it's Friday, and he picks me up and we head to a bar across town. I had known this bar was there forever as I grew up there, but had never been inside. We were the youngest ones there by about 30 years and there was literally only 10 people total inside, including us and the bartender. Weird. Whatever. 
We have a few drinks, play some pool, and it's time to leave. I kept my pace and only had two cocktails because I didn't want to get drunk with someone I didn't know. He, unbeknownst to me, was about to be pretty tossed, so we leave, not wanting to go home, I agreed to go to his house and hang out some more. He lived with his grandmother at the time, and had a pool table. We wandered the house for a bit, him showing me random pictures of him growing up, awards won, etc. We play a game and I let him know I need to be getting home. I lived about 20 minutes away by car. He says he's too drunk to drive and that I should stay. Now, I lived with my mom and we didn't always see eye to eye. So calling her 2-3am to and waking her up to ask for a ride was not in my list of plans. I told him fine, I would walk. It would have taken me over an hour to walk home, but I was not about to sleep at this guy's house and would have rather taken my chances. The route home didn't go through any bad areas and I had been a pedestrian for years at that point, so I was used to walking everywhere and was fine with it. All of a sudden, he can drive and doesn't want me walking home alone. Again, whatever. We get to my house and I thank him for the ride and now he tells me he is too drunk to drive and can't drive home. The place my mom and I lived in was three stories and I had the whole bottom floor to myself and a makeshift living room with couches so I figured screw it, seep it off on the couch and go home in the morning. By now, I had already decided this was going to be the only date we ever went on. Not because of the whole driving situation, but I just wasn't into him. He proceeds to lay on my bed the minute I let him inside like some stray dog or something. So being tired and annoyed and just basically over it, I said fine, I'll sleep on the couch. Well, I don't know how long I was asleep, or how he even stayed awake, because it took me forever to fall asleep knowing he was there and this was all just too weird. I wake up to this guy's hands around my throat, well, kinda woke up. I remember laying there with my eyes closed and my mind thinking, what's going on? So I pretended to roll over to basically let him know I wasn't unconscious, and he stopped. 20 minutes later, same thing. This time I sat up, pushed him away, and started yelling at him. What are you doing? Get out. Now. And the strangest thing was, it was like he wasn't even fully there. His eyes were open, but it's like he was in a trance and wasn't even fully aware of what was happening. I grabbed his keys and wallet off the table, opened the door, shoved him outside, threw his keys and wallet at him, and slammed the door. He never knocked or anything, and I kept the lights off so he couldn't see me watching him through the window, phone in hand ready to call 911. My mom was two floors above asleep. He kind of staggered off where I couldn't see him, so I just sat on my bed listening. 30 minutes later, I heard his car start and drive off. I logged onto MySpace right away, blocked him, and blocked his number in my phone. I showed my boss his picture the next day, explained the situation, and just let him know that if I ever saw him walking again, that I was walking to the back until he left, and to just tell him I quit. Never heard from him again. I, a 23-year-old female, grew up in a rural area in Ontario. It was the kind of place where you never locked the doors because you knew everyone in town. The all too trusting small town mentality stayed with me once I moved to a big city for university. I got an apartment in a student area with a college nearby and plenty of bars within walking distance. I lived with a guy friend, Roddy, who was a few years older than me from the same small town. I would go to the bars with friends on the weekends and stumble home by myself around 2am. One night on my way home, my neighbor Kyle and I met in the hallway both headed to our own places. He was also drunk and good looking. He said hello and invited me inside. I ended up staying the night with him. He was nice and it was a fun night, if not a little awkward. We didn't exchange numbers and it didn't seem like we cared for anything to come out of it, so I went home in the morning and that was that. Fast forward to two days later. I was asleep in my bed and my roommate was half asleep on the couch with the TV on. He heard a sound that might have been the door creaking open, but he ignored it in his tired state. A few minutes later, he opened his eyes to see a naked man standing in front of him, lifeless and staring into his eyes. It was Kyle. Roddy tried to talk to him and ask him what he was doing here, but he didn't respond. Roddy ran to my room and said, uh, I think Kyle's here to see you. So I followed him out into the living room and saw completely naked Kyle, staring at us with the most serious and concentrated eyes I had ever seen. Roddy tried to talk to him and asked him to leave, but once again he didn't respond. Instead, he went into our kitchen and opened the fridge. He proceeded to take our butter out and start smearing it all over his face and chest, saying nothing, and still with a completely serious look on his face. Roddy and I ran to my bedroom to talk about what to do. While we were in my room, Kyle walked down the dark hallway that led to us and stood in the dark right before the light of my room could reach him. All you could see was his silhouette and he started whispering hi, hi, repeatedly. Roddy and I ended up calling the police and staying in my room until they came and took him back to his house. They said he must have been on drugs but probably wasn't a threat. I agreed I didn't think he was a threat, but I didn't sleep well that night knowing he was a thin wall away from us in that apartment.
My family decided to fly across the country to visit me in LA, where I live. We thought it would be nice to visit Catalina Island. When we arrived, it became apparent to us that it was off season. It was late November, the weather was cold, and as a result, the island was nearly empty besides locals and a few straggling tourists such as ourselves. Our first priority was to ditch our luggage so we could explore the island, so we immediately checked into our motel, though that word hardly does the place justice. I called a motel because all the doors to the rooms exited to the outside, but in actuality our room was one of the 20 to 30 quaint guest house looking buildings arranged in sort of a horseshoe shape around a walkway, with rooms on either side of the path. The entrance to the motel was essentially one of the points of the horseshoe, and if you walked dead straight, you'd reach the room we were given, essentially on the corner before you have to go right to go further into the horseshoe. So from our room, one path led back to the street, the other further into the secluded maze of rooms. After a day of exploring and having just finished dinner, it was time for the cold, dark walk back to the room. Catalina Island is a decent distance from the mainland, and it gets dark. I pulled my black hoodie tighter over my freezing ears and walked ahead of my parents to the hotel room, telling them I just wanted to go to sleep and I did immediately. I was already losing consciousness as they entered after me, drifting off without so much as a good night. I then woke up to my mom saying my name, a harsh whisper. The room had two beds, my parents' bed closer to the door and mine further in the room. My mom's voice cut through the silence again. She sounded concerned for me. I didn't blame her, considering my mental state at the time. Groggy, I rolled over. What? I asked. As my eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight coming in through the curtains, I saw her turn to face me. She was surprised to see me in my bed. Her eyes got wide. If I'm in my bed, who was she talking to? We both looked back to where she was previously looking to see a hooded figure in all black standing over their bed. This was horrifically startling as it was on an island in the middle of the ocean and wake up to see a hooded stranger looming over you. This moment seemed to last forever. My mom's words became low and severe as she said my dad's name in a dire voice I've never heard her use before. Then the hooded figure did something so bizarre and unsettling. It didn't advance towards us, but instead crouched in the corner near where it stood. The way it crouched was so absolutely unexpected, even in regards to this already unexpected situation, that it terrified me. It seemed animalistic. I knew two things. The hooded figure had been standing over us sleeping, and it's not acting in any sort of way that I could understand. As opposed to the infinite moment of this figure standing over us mere seconds ago, the series of events that unfolded when my hulking ex-military dad woke up happened in an instant. Suddenly, we were out the door, not knowing which way the intruder went. My mom was screaming, get him, get him. My dad was running down one path of the horseshoe, further into the hotel, shouting through sheer adrenaline. I ran down the other path, towards the street. When I got there, not a sign of the intruder, but it became suspiciously quiet behind me. I ran back to the room to find my dad quietly walking back, his head low. He gets really close to me and I hear him say, it's a kid. The explanation, some young teen, tall and lanky as I am in my 20s, wearing all black including a black hoodie, went into the wrong room, our room, the one time my parents just so happened to forget to lock the door. My mom woke up when he entered, and seeing a tall person in a black hoodie, thought he was me, assumingly leaving the room, and when the hooded figure crouched, that was him when he realized his mistake and panicked. He was scared of us. As I got back to the room, my mom walked out and hugs this kid, who was now crying his eyes out. I would be too if a massive ex-soldier was sprinting after me with murder in his eyes. So, to the now traumatized kid from Catalina Island, sorry for the misunderstanding. For a bit of backstory, I live in a big city which is mostly a friendly place, but like all cities, it has its rough areas. There are two main spots that are known to be particularly rough, and for the first 14 years of my life, I lived in one of those areas. So though it can naturally be a bit uncomfortable, I tend to be pretty unbothered by odd people talking to me in the street. Anyway, I moved from one rough area and moved to a safer one, but it's very close to where I originally lived. I know both of these areas pretty well, to which helped me with what happened 5 months ago. I had some stuff going on in my personal life and going through phases of bad anxiety as it is. I had to make the decision to take some time off of work but wanted to try and stay in a routine and be productive. I went to the dentist way past when I should have. So I made an appointment and when it rolled around, I walked there. My dentist is in the rough area that I now live close to. On my route home, I have to walk past a pub on a main road which has a super bad reputation. Anything you can think of, it's happened inside or just outside of this pub. Anyway, I noticed someone sat on the bench outside the pub. I have my headphones in but see him saying something so I assume he's asking me for something and take an earplug out. He asked me if I want to join him for a drink, this was around 11.30am by the way, I just said no thanks. 
Now as soon as I got a few steps away, I had this bad feeling like something was just not right. As I mentioned though, I was going through a phase of bad anxiety, so I chalked it up to just being that. After about 2 minutes, I go to turn left, and see the man walking in my direction in the corner of my eye. I told myself it was nothing, but took my headphones out anyway just in case, as I was about to walk through a narrow road that leads to a car park and is always very empty. All of a sudden I hear him shouting at me, hey miss, I'm talking to you, wait. He catches up to me and tells me, I'm not a creep but you're too beautiful to let go. I try and stay polite but also make it clear I'm not interested. He asked if I was single, I said yes, but he asked what I was doing that night, I said I had no plans. I 100% know I should have lied and as the truth came out I was really annoyed with myself but whatever. He seems to get the message and I say I really have to go so I carry on walking thinking that it's the end of it. So I make my way across this big car park. At the end of the car park is a cycle slash pedestrian lane that has a massive wall on one side with two lots of steps that lead to a car park to a retail park and bushes on the other end and it's super narrow. I get into the lane and hear footsteps like someone is running, probably a jogger. I'm getting paranoid until right behind me I hear, at least give me your number. I finally start to panic and realize actually it's not my anxiety and this is super shady. I give him my number but change the last digit and this guy proceeds to attempt to drop call me. Clearly my phone doesn't ring and then he starts getting annoyed saying I need to give him the right number. He then has his hand basically on my phone, standing way too close to me and orders me to type his number in and drop call him. Creep now has my number. Still not enough for him, I reiterate that I'm on my way somewhere and seriously need to get going. He then grabbed me by my elbow and I had a massive adrenaline rush. Next thing I knew I was at the top of one of those sets of steps that lead to a much busier and open space. I ran as fast as I could. Luckily one of my friends works in one of the stores in the retail park so I ran over to it practically looking over my shoulder the whole time. I find my friend, visibly shaking, can barely speak, she asks if I'm okay and I just burst into tears. I gather my thoughts and tell my friend what just happened. He's been calling my phone this whole time. She takes my phone and notes his number and then blocks him. She takes me to the staff room and convinces me to follow a police report which I do. Unfortunately though, I found out street harassment is not actually illegal where I live, but because he made physical contact it might not be a complete lost cause. The police tell me they will be in touch. Now fast forward until around two weeks later. A mom's friend who knew about what happened sent her an article and asked her to show me. I genuinely couldn't believe my eyes. It was about a man who had followed a girl and then assaulted her in the same rough area. At the end of the article is a picture, it's him. I haven't heard anything from the police and since he had already been charged, I figured there wasn't any need for me to contact them again. My heart goes out to the girl and although currently in jail, I really hope neither of us ever have to face him again. His charge was pretty serious so he will be there for a long time thankfully. The following experience happened to me a few years ago when I was on the train home from school. It was around 10 p.m. at night as I had stayed back in a public library to study. One thing you should know is that my train line is particularly dodgy and you can meet some truly weird people on the train when it's late. When I got onto my carriage that night, it was particularly empty apart from three women sitting on the opposite end of the carriage. I sat down and plugged my earphones in to watch YouTube. My train ride usually takes around 45 minutes. About three stops into the train ride and the only other person who had gotten onto my carriage at the time was a man who was wearing construction clothes. He sat near the three women, so I assumed he knew them. I turned my attention back to my video. A few minutes later, I noticed that the three women who were sitting on the opposite side of my carriage had moved to my side. I didn't really think much of it as I was engrossed in the video I was watching. That's when I noticed someone take a seat opposite of me. It was the man who had gotten on earlier. He asked me my name, but he was giving me a weird vibe so I pretended like I couldn't hear him. I had my earphones in after all. He then proceeded to tap my knee to gain my attention, there was no use ignoring him, so I removed my earphones and looked at him. He was a big guy, probably around early 40s and he was clean shaven. He asked me my name, to which I gave him a fake name. He then asked me how old I was. I was in my school uniform at the time, so I told him. He reached out his hand and introduced himself. Not wanting to be rude, I extended my own hand to shake his hand. This is when things started to get weird. His handshake was super weird. His grip was abnormally tight and he seems to pull my hand towards him as he shook it. I quickly withdrew my hand. He then asked me if I had a girlfriend as he thought I was quite attractive. Alarm bells began to ring in my head and glanced over at the three women who refused to even look over my direction. Seeing as they would be no help, I would just have to look out for myself. He then took out his phone and started showing me a picture of a girl who seemed to look around my age. He then asked me if I thought she was beautiful. Again, not wanting to be rude, I simply nodded and said she was. He then asked me if I would be interested in marrying her. I just started laughing as I thought he was just joking around, but his eyes were dead serious, and he just glared at me. 
He repeated his question, to which I responded that I did not know her and that it was inappropriate. He suggested that I give him my number so that he could arrange for us to meet. This seriously creeped me out and I politely declined stating that I was busy with school and that I was not looking to get into a relationship. As I said this, the train was coming to a halt at a station. I was still three stops away from mine, but I decided that it was time for me to get out of the situation. I apologized that this was my stop and that it was nice to meet him. As I got up to leave, he extended his hand for a handshake and thanked me for talking to him. I didn't want to shake his hand, but I did not want to trigger him, so I reached out my hand. Suddenly, he grabbed my hand and pulled it towards him. His eyes were full of anger. He then asked, What, you don't want to marry my daughter? I will break you. I quickly broke the grip and left the carriage. As it was nighttime, there were always police officers patrolling the platforms. I rushed towards one of the officers and told him everything that happened. I then described his clothing and which carriage he was sitting on. While waiting for the next train, the same officer came up to me and told me that officers had picked him up two stations down and thanked me for letting him know. Although the officer asked for my details, I was never notified as to what happened to him. I just hope that I never have to experience a man on a train like that in the future. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I was about 19 and I transferred to a college very, very far from home. My parents had raised me pretty dependent so it didn't upset me. I saw it as a fun challenge. One of the biggest changes to get used to was not having a car. I could have gotten one, I guess, but it would have just been a hassle to find places to keep it when I wasn't at school, etc. So I just opted for the bus instead. I'm not a big fan of person-to-person -person interactions, so I always made sure to sit up front, hopefully by myself, with my bag in the other seat. And not only headphones in, but a book open as well. All friendly signals to please go away. Thing is, I'm not that great at actually telling people to go away. I had gotten on the bus to head to the mall for a bit, and I realized someone was talking to me. I paused my music and looked up. A homeless man was asking, if the seat was taken. There weren't really a lot of people on the bus, but I felt awkward and very rude saying no, like I was judging him. I didn't want to appear unkind, so I moved my bag and then made a big show of putting my music back on and raising my book up to read. I had to keep pausing my music because the man kept talking to me. I kept trying to downplay it to myself that it was just his idea of small talk, even though the questions pointedly fixated on details about me, my age, how pretty I was, if I had a boyfriend, I let and said yes, of course, and that didn't dissuade interest at all, and so on. It was a very, very long 20 minutes. He kept getting closer, never overtly touching or filling the space in a way that I could make an obvious complaint about, but by the time we arrived he was practically faced completely toward me. It was definitely blocking me from moving to another seat. Finally my stop came and I jumped up. He was perfectly nice about moving so that I could get by, or so I thought. Turns out he was actually just getting up himself to get out of the same spot, not pausing for a moment and talking to me. Great. It was the middle of the day on a crowded street, so I didn't feel like I was in imminent danger, and therefore felt that anything other than open welcoming would be the height of rudeness for me. I smiled awkwardly and moved on toward the mall, only for him to fall in step with me, continuing to ask for details about myself and my boyfriend. Being naive, I tried to cut him off with, oh, I'm headed to the mall, but of course that only gave him the chance to say, me too. And well, we headed there together. He started talking to me about how good of friends we were now and how close he felt to me and so on. Honestly, I checked out a good while ago and was trying to find ways to ditch this guy. I ducked into the first store I saw when I got to the mall and he followed me in. I was at this point not even making full sentences, just mumbling things about, oh sorry, I need to, and then I tried to lose him down another aisle. It didn't work. I finally made a turn he couldn't follow quick enough and literally hid behind some shelves waiting for him to go by. I dashed out of the store and he saw me and yelled at me to wait and ran after. I ran down the strip and dashed into a random store and went straight to the back to the dressing rooms. I hid in one of them for as long as I felt that I could and then I peeked out and saw him in the larger mall area, scanning. He finally moved off down the wrong way and I stayed in the store another half an hour, pretending to look at clothes. I don't know what the shop girls must have thought, I was clearly shaken and to the point of tears, but I had called my mother by that point and was keeping her on the phone. When I left, I ran out of the mall and went around to a different bus stop, in case the man would be back at the first one. I was so scared that he would show up again and this time follow me to my apartment. There's a lot I didn't do right in that situation, but I'm just glad I was lucky enough to lose the guy. I can't say what my job was, because what I did was literally the name of the company, but it had something to do with law and a small basement office. This office had two main rooms and a bathroom. The boss worked in the room in the back, while the rest of us, three in total, worked in the front. This wasn't a place where clients came and met with us, it was just where we got work done on computers and packages sent before leaving. Oftentimes I worked alone the last three hours, which in reality was great. I got to listen to whatever music I want, sing and get stuff done on the computer. 
On occasion, my boss would come to pick something up or just get a bit more work done. And on this day, he did, but he came in with an older gentleman that I didn't recognize. My boss explained that the man was a customer from one of the companies on the top floor and he left only to realize he really needed to go to the bathroom and asked to use ours. My boss stuck around near my desk until the man left and then got to work. As I continued to work, I began to cough and wheeze a bit. Breathing became painful and, at first, I didn't know why until I gradually got a whiff of smoke. Cigarette smoke. None of my co-workers smoked and I don't know if I'm allergic or intolerant to cigarette smoke, but I instantly feel ill whenever I begin breathing it in. I shrugged it off and watched my breathing being sure nothing bad was happening to me and not soon after my boss grabbed his coat and began to leave. He said, your co-worker will be coming in a bit just to pick some stuff up and as he opened the door, the scent of smoke burst through and on the ground were cigarette buds from what he said. Thus, he continued with, and let's have you lock the door behind me too. I couldn't agree more, that was creepy. But if it was the man who used our bathroom, it wasn't too strange to assume he'd hunkered at the bottom of the stairs to take in some smoke before leaving. When my boss left, I made extra sure that the door was locked before continuing with my work. Another hour had passed by, about an hour and a half remaining of work when I began to smell smoke again. My heart sank as I turned my eyes to the door and quietly got up from my chair. I usually took off my shoes at work. Like I said, we didn't have clients come there. We were pretty chill when it came to wardrobe, but even with them off, I tiptoed over to the door and pressed my ear against it. I didn't hear anything at first, however, the scent of smoke was prominent there. For one reason or another, I decided just to go back to my desk and wait until my coworker got there. Not 10 minutes more in though, I heard this click, click, click sound. It was subtle and I had to look around to spot where it was coming from. It was the doorknob of our office. From where I sat, I could see it just slightly jerk back and forth. The person was doing it slowly as I was sure they were trying to be quiet. By this point, I called up my coworker to come sooner. In some ways, I felt safe. I was in a locked area after all, but who knows, right? After calling him though, the scent began to diminish and the doorknob stopped moving. I tried to listen for someone going up the stairs. I didn't hear anything for a long while until I heard someone coming down them. It was my coworker. He came in and said, there are like 10 cigarette buds out here. I explained further what had happened as he came in and locked the door himself. I also explained the man who'd come in to use our bathroom prior. Like I said, I couldn't be sure if they were the same person. There wasn't much to take from the offices. The computers were fairly old, wouldn't at all get a good chunk of money from them, and everything else was paper. We weren't at all at a place that kept money around. So if it was him, I can't fathom what he saw that he'd feel the need to come back in to steal. My coworker somewhat brushed it off. He figured that the person was gone, all was fine, and went to pick up what he needed to. He ended up staying for a while, I'm not sure why, perhaps he felt like he needed to. Because as I began finally finishing up my work, the smell of smoke came back. A coworker and I looked at each other, almost as a way to confirm that we both smelled it. The click clacking of our computer stopped and we just waited and waited and waited. We didn't take our eyes off each other as the click, click, click came back. I just didn't want to deal with this and go home as soon as possible, but I shirked the thought of walking out there. My coworker was far more fed up. He stood, stomped at the door, unlocked it, and opened it. There was a man there. I didn't get a good look at him. I saw him raise his arm, freeze, and then he disappeared and sprinted up the stairs. My coworker walks me to my car soon after, told our boss about it, and we made it a rule that we always lock the door from that point on. Especially me, because after that day, every now and then, I'd smell smoke and hear the doorknob attempt to twist. Whenever I did, I either called up my boss or waited every now and then, and then I heard the steps leave. Frankly, we should have put a camera up or called the police, something at least. When my coworker described him to my boss, it seemed like he was the same man who used our bathroom, but that is just speculation. We have no idea what he wanted or if there was a purpose. Be careful letting people use bathrooms, they could have ulterior motives. When I was about 8 or 9, my family took a trip skiing to a small resort a couple of hours from where we lived in Spain. The resort itself was a sleepy little town of about 400 to 500 people max, with a few small supermarkets and hotels, and not much else. Typically, we picked the worst time possible to embark on the trip, which we had been planning for a good few years. The night after we arrived there was a blizzard, and so we spent the first half of the week locked in the hotel. Although we were able to go outside for the remaining few days, we had little to do given that the slopes were shut. The story I want to tell comes from those first few days locked in the hotel. Despite my parents' annoyance at the timing of the trip being a nightmare, myself and my sister, who was 11 months older, were having a fantastic time. Locked up in the mountains with nothing to do, we were able to spend our days running around the hotel, eating sweets and watching the TV in the lobby. I should probably mention at this point that the hotel was somewhat of a maze. 
The large bar restaurant area where my parents sat each day reading was at the center of the hotel. The myriad of smaller rooms then connected to the bar area at random points, shooting off in different directions. These rooms often had no discernible function. Each one had the same mahogany interior, and they were full of couches, fireplaces, and antiques that allowed for great games of hide and seek. The rooms would often have offshoots themselves, connecting to new rooms which would then connect to yet more useless wooden caves. As such, it was possible to be four or five rooms away from the main hotel area at any one time, without knowing exactly where you were or how to get back. Anyway, at some point along the weekend, myself and my sister decided to play hide and seek. Bearing in mind the above, it was almost an impossible challenge to find the hider. At one point in the game, I was just about to give up on searching for my sister until I heard her voice from what sounded like a few rooms away. After successfully navigating the web of rooms, I emerged to find her sitting on a couch alongside a German man with gray hair, probably in his 60s if I had to guess. As soon as I emerged into the room, the man turned to me and told me he was taking my sister to the swimming pool and asked if I wanted to come. I remember immediately thinking it was odd that there was a swimming pool that we hadn't heard of. My parents had been complaining that morning about how much TV we were watching and so I was sure they would have taken us there if they had known about it. And besides, the hotel did not seem of the size to be able to host one. I told the man that I have to ask my parents first, and told my sister to come back with me to find them. He immediately replied that I should go and that he should take my sister on ahead. I told my sister that she absolutely had to come with me, but excited at the thought of the swimming pool, she said she didn't want to. We began to argue, with the man taking my sister's side and encouraging me to go ask my parents permission whilst he waited with my sister. I dug my foot in, telling my sister that our parents would be very cross if we went somewhere on our own. And after a few minutes bickering, she eventually gave in and came back with me, giving her assurance to the man that we'd come back. Of course, when we told our parents, they were livid. My dad went back to the room to try and find the man, but with all the offshoots and given that all the random rooms looked the same, it was almost impossible to be sure that we were in the right one. In any case, there was no sign of him. I remember my dad screaming at the hotel lobby that he needed a list of all male guests and their room numbers, but of course they wouldn't give it to him. We spent the rest of the trip by our parents' side, terrified at the thought of being locked up in a blizzard with him. Thankfully, we never saw the man again. My mom and I normally shopped at the market just a few minutes away from our house. My mom had been shopping there for 20 some years at this point and was friends with most of the workers, so I was friendly with them too and was always happy to talk to them. Whenever my mom got distracted talking to someone, I, with the attention span of a 6 year old, would wander around the aisle. My mother would keep an eye on me to make sure I didn't get too far, but if she was distracted, one of the employees would usually be around and gently guide me back over. One day though, we went to a different market that I couldn't remember having been to before and we didn't go back to for nearly a decade. We were walking around the aisles when my mom ran into her friend. They started talking and I, not realizing that I no longer had a store full of adults keeping an eye on me, started wandering around the aisle. My eyes caught some colorful display, I think flowers or balloons or something, and went over to look. Once I was satisfied with my inspection, I turned back to the aisle only to find my mom wasn't there. Huh, that had never happened before. I looked around a little, though not moving from my spot near the colorful displays. Since it was right near the registers, there was a decent amount of people nearby, which I'm thankful for now. As I was looking around, an employee came up to me. He was older than my sister, she was 12 or 13 at the time, and younger than my dad, in his mid-40s, which was about the only way I could gauge age. Now, I would say he was probably in his early to mid-20s if I remember right. Hi there, he said sweetly, in that tone you normally speak to kids in. I cheerfully said hello, actually stepping a little closer. Are you looking for mommy? I say yes, happily explaining that I had last seen her talking to her friend and that I could normally find her easily when I wandered away, so I wasn't sure where she could have gone. Does she leave you alone often? Not really. My older sister was normally with me if my mom wasn't. She was 12 or 13 and she was super mature, so if my mom had to leave her for a little bit, she knew I'd be okay. She never left us alone in public, just at home if she needed to run somewhere, never for very long. And my dad was at work a lot, and didn't come back until late usually. Where do you live? Well, you wouldn't know it, I just learned my address. We just learned how to mail a letter in school, even took a little class trip to the mailbox in our school corner to send them out. I knew how to write my address now, and I knew how to say it. Where do you go to school? Who picks you up? Well, I go to the local elementary school. I don't know the address though, sorry, but I know which street it's on because I wait on the sidewalk for my mom or daycare sitter, depending on the day, so I see the street sign a lot since I'm usually waiting for a while to be grabbed. It had only been a few minutes since I last saw my mom, even with how much information I was dumping, I was a very fast talker, but I was starting to get a little antsy. 
not because I was uncomfortable talking to a stranger, but because I had skipped lunch that day specifically to call my mom into letting me get a bagel from the store next door, which is why we were at the market in the first place. My mom was holding us to the bagel to make sure I didn't try to eat it too fast and choke, which I had done several times in the past. I wanted my bagel, and while I liked talking to this grown man who made me feel smart and was oh so interested in my life, I liked bagels more. Plus, if I caught my mom when we were near the bakery section, I might be able to use my charm and get a cookie. So I gotta find my mom now. Oh well, I'll walk around with you and help you find her. You wouldn't lead me through the market you work at where you can easily bring me to the back room, meet locker, or any number of places? Yeah, sounds good. Ozzy. I look around to see my mom, the relieved look on her face slowly changing into something more anxious. I smile happily and wave her over. She immediately grabs my hand and I can tell she wants to chide me, probably for leaving the aisle, but she seems more occupied on the man in front of me. Before I can even open my mouth to introduce him, or remember that I never got his name, he quickly says that he's glad I found my mom and he needs to get back to work and practically runs to the back of the store. My mom puts her hands on my shoulders and looks me in the eye, her expression a lot more worried now. What was he talking to you about, she asked, her voice more serious than I'd ever heard her. Can I have my bagel? My mom opens her mouth, pauses, and goes into her purse to hand me my bagel. Between bites, I happily tell her about the conversation and everything I remembered. My age and grade, pickup schedule, likes and dislikes, my literal address. My mom gradually became paler, then became red with anger. She brought me over to the manager, and I don't remember much about the conversation. The police weren't called. We went home, and my mom told me I wasn't allowed to walk around the store anymore. No more talking to any stranger, even if they worked at the store we were at, unless she was with me. If I ever saw that man ever again, I was to run away, find someone I know, and ask for help. If all else fails, scream at the top of my lungs. If my mom had have found me, something bad might have happened. If not in the store, then in front of my school, and if not in front of my school, then my house. A little over a decade later, I've never seen the guy again. Let's keep it that way. I had started hanging out with a very nasty crowd. They loved to party, never had their own cash, destructive, impulsive, you get the drill. An ex friend of mine, we'll call him Bob, started hanging out with me quite a bit more and more as the weeks passed by. Bob worked as a pizza delivery driver. He never, I mean never washed his clothes, to which he owned maybe three outfits, including his work uniform and only women's clothes. The women's clothes he wore to be punky, I saw no shame in that. Even thought it was kinda cool how he didn't care what others thought about it. But that also means he liked my clothes, so like a little sister might do, he constantly took my clothes. Keep in mind, he also barely showered. Often, he even woke up before 5pm in time for work, he jumped off my couch, took a pack of my cigarettes without asking and sped off. Within the 4 month period he stayed in my home, I literally saw him go to take a shower about 5 times. Long after the situation was dealt with and he was gone, I left that home with a stench. He paid nothing, not a single bill, never contributed to groceries, cleaning, nothing. Nor was he on my lease, yet he established residency in my home legally. It didn't bother me so much at the time. I was at my rock bottom and was basically just happy to have someone be there with me. I considered him to be my goofy and annoying best friend, until that wasn't enough for him. He began to become obsessed with me. Very quickly he went from basically having everything he needed in life for free, while he kept any money or tips he made, but decided on his own accord that we were to be together. If I'd return home from work, friend's house, etc., he'd cry and follow me room to room, asking repeatedly why we can't just be together, that we were best friends already, we should date. I was not attracted to him. Going through a divorce at the time, I did not want to ruin our friendship. It got to the point where I avoided going home. I'd stay with my mother or friends because he'd cry and follow me, desperately trying to convince me to be with him. I'd almost often find him in my bed at this point, and he quit his job to have a better chance of seeing me. I had told him if this continued, I would no longer allow him to crash there. At one point, after avoiding him for a few days, Bob really started to come out of his shell. He cornered me screaming, I'm sick and tired of being rejected by you. It's not happening anymore. Now I was scared. I never saw him as a threatening individual before, just a goofy character. I asked him to leave and he was no longer welcome. He refused. He said by law, he was required a 30 days notice to be evicted. When I spoke with the police, they understood my situation, but explained he'd either have to be evicted or I'd have to get a restraining order. I filed the restraining order, which they immediately granted me, but he chose to ignore it. Once he left my home, I locked all doors and windows. When he returned, I showed him the order, to which he replied, I'm not leaving. I tried calling the police every time he showed up, but by the time they'd get there, he was gone. There were shoe prints on the door, and cracks from all the attempts he made to force it open. 
and never shut correctly after those attempts, and they were never able to officially serve him because they supposedly couldn't find him. I honestly believe they tried once, then gave up. I provided them with his plates, friends addresses where he'd stayed, previous employment, everything needed. I'd stay up late, here in his vehicle, it was very loud and easily identified, slowly drive by my home, staring at me. Day and night. At one time, he even hid behind my front door, had a mutual friend knock, then jumped out, shut the door open, and entered. Even went as far to message my young, underage nephew who he met maybe one time on Facebook to try and gain sympathy and convince him to get me to change my mind, crossing even more obvious boundaries. It was a living nightmare. Eventually, he moved on to his next obsession, and I was somewhat at peace. Several months later, he was on our local news for attempting to slit his ex-girlfriend's throat and beating her until she was unconscious, until a neighbor brushed over and he fled. All I could think was how that could have been me. When I was 18, almost 10 years ago, I had a phone call that completely changed my life. I got woken up at almost 6am by an unknown number. I figured it was my boyfriend, now husband, since his phone number usually showed up as the famous unknown number. He usually called me before going to work at around 7.30am, but sometimes he'd call me at 6ish if he wanted to talk to me while waking up. I answer, he says what's up, and I'm still half asleep but start talking. He tells me he has a little problem and that he wants to see me. Being 18 and the fact that I started dating him recently, I also was down for this. He tells me how he absolutely loved seeing me last weekend and how good I looked. He basically described what we had done during the weekend. If I remember properly, his parents weren't home for the weekend and we had the house and the car to drive around. And we had lots of fun obviously, and how much he loved some of the things I did to him. I replied and I was more and more awake and we were having a really good time. Then I noticed it was almost 7am, time where he usually takes a shower, eats, and gets ready to go out the door. And I basically ask him, so this is fun and all, but aren't you going to get ready for work? He reply with, uh, no, I think I'll skip work today. How about I come over? Now the thing is, by then I was pretty awake and although the voice that was talking to me was very similar to my boyfriend's, something threw me off. My boyfriend doesn't say, uh, no, like this guy does. Besides, I knew that unless he was sick, my boyfriend would never skip work because he was scheduling his shifts and missing his shift was a big deal that could get him fired. I kind of froze. He noticed it so he said, oh babe, you're right, I should start getting dressed, so you want me to come over? By then I swear that his voice was back to my boyfriend's voice and I just felt silly. So what if he wanted to skip a day at work? Maybe he just wanted to see me. So I tell him, yeah, sure, come over, it will only be us here. He replied, great. Then he asked, where's your house? The last time I checked, I'm pretty sure my boyfriend knows where I live. He had been coming over for weeks now. I laugh it off and tell him, ha, huh, you know where it is. That's when he laughed, and his laugh was absolutely not my boyfriend's laugh. I instantly ask him, you're not my boyfriend's name, are you? He said, can you just hang on please? I need to go grab something. Meanwhile, I get a text from my boyfriend. I figure that maybe this is just a sick joke. Maybe he coordinated it perfectly. Maybe he's sick and his voice doesn't sound the same. The text from my boyfriend said, at the subway, going to work now, love you. I texted him saying, why are you texting me? We are talking right now. At which point my actual boyfriend called. He was very confused at first and figured someone had hacked into his MSN. When I told him it was by phone, he reassured me that he absolutely did not call me and that whoever it was, it was not him. He had to go as the subway train was there, but that he will call as soon as he was at work. Then, the other guy called back, I picked up and I asked him, who are you? What do you want? I pretty much went crazy on him. He said that his name was Mike, that we had met a long time ago, which was impossible because my phone number was fairly recent, and that he just wanted to have fun, that he didn't know I had a boyfriend. I asked him how did he know that I was wearing and what did we do and how he got my phone number. He just said, where are you? Why don't we meet? At which point I hung up. He called again. I didn't answer. Within minutes, I had called my mom to tell her what happened. She told me to change my phone number and not to stay home alone. I changed my phone number right away. I also alerted local police. They opened a file, but nothing ever came out of it. I still wonder how he knew what we did and what I was wearing. My boyfriend swore at the time he would never let any of his friends know all that, but his parents' house did have lots of windows and we weren't exactly careful. So Mike, let's never meet again. This happened while I was in college, five years ago. I was a transfer student and was 21 at the time. I was set up to be living in a building that was for students 21 or older and moved in a week and a half before classes began. This school was in northern Michigan so when I first arrived, campus was dead. I mostly kept to myself but was friendly with a few people in my building, namely one guy named Khalil, an exchange student from Lebanon. He seemed nice enough, though there was a distinct language barrier, so things were easy lost in translation. Our RD and RA, resident director, resident assistant, made everyone who had moved in have a meeting to go over basic rules and whatnot. 
At the end of the meeting as I'm leaving the rec room, Khalil suddenly puts his arm up on the wall in front of me, almost clotheslining me. Cut off guard, I am peeved and creeped out about this. He begins explaining that he would like to be my friend and would like to go out for dinner to get to know me. He worded it oddly, so I wasn't sure if it was just a date or just a friendly invitation, but I attribute it to his bad English. Like an idiot, I felt cornered physically and socially. I am awful with confrontation and could be too nice, so I agreed. He met right then and there, however, and said, I will get us a taxi and we'll go now. Ten minutes later, we're getting into this taxi and as I'm entering, I feel this sense of dread. I think, I barely know this guy, and Hudson's, the restaurant, is a couple miles away and we will be stranded out there with this stranger if it gets weird. As we drive, my guard rises higher and higher. He wants to know everything about me, and is throwing questions rapid fire. My age, dating history, physical preferences in men, religion, family, everything. I am thinking, this is going to be really awkward, and wanted the night to be over before we even get to the restaurant. At the restaurant, we both look at the menu for a bit, the waiter comes and takes my order, salad, small and quick to eat, and then the waiter asks what Khalil wants. He says, oh no, I'm not hungry, I just want to watch her eat. What? Why would you ask me for dinner if you weren't hungry? And why did you just want me to eat? I was horrified. All of my family was in the lower peninsula of Michigan, eight hours away. I had no friends up here, the only local numbers I had were of my RA and RD. I speedy all of my salad as Khalil watches me, now talking about himself. He tells me about how he has anger problems and is looking for a woman to help calm him, but still be a submissive traditional wife. I am trying to hide the horror and uneasiness as I nod and eat. He continues explaining how he was known for his temper back home and how his brothers have stopped him from doing awful things. At this point, red flags blinding my vision, it's time to end this. I finish my food and tell him to get a taxi back to campus. I intentionally sat in front of the taxi. I wasn't allowing the possibility of physical contact. When we get to the campus, we get in the building and I say a quick thank you and haul back to my room. Door locked, I get into my sweats and try to chalk it up to a weird experience and vow to avoid Khalil from then on. Around 12.30am, I hear a knock on my door. I was watching Netflix and took out my earbuds to make sure I was hearing right. The knocking continues. Not a courteous knock knock knock, but a closed fist pounding. I am petrified and making as little noise as possible. Get to the door and look out the people. Hole. I see Khalil. My room is at the very end of a long hallway. All rooms around me empty at this point, with a door outside of my room leading to a parking lot surrounded by woods. Knowing how isolated I was, I slink away from the door, making zero noise just waiting for the knocking to stop. About a minute later, it stops. He growls, I know you're in there. I will wait. My eyes widen in horror. I felt a mixture of rage and panic, but decided that confronting him then wouldn't be smart. So I quietly watch Netflix until I fall asleep. I have no idea how long he waited out there. The next morning, when I finally emerged from my room, I found a couple of pages taped to my door. Three handwritten pages from Khalil, explaining his feelings for me and his intentions of making me his wife. I went straight to my RA and explained everything that happened. She agreed to meet with Khalil herself, to explain to him how inappropriate he was being and to tell him to leave me alone. He didn't. Notes kept coming. He came to my door dozens of times a day and I became pretty much trapped in my room hiding from the psycho. It lasted for 8 days, but classes began and Khalil disappeared. I was told he dropped out and moved back to Lebanon. I found it eerie how he just vanished. Had he come here solely to find a wife, I'll never know. But Khalil, let's not ever meet again. It was the middle of the afternoon and I was home from college for the weekend, driving home from an auto shop having just picked up my car after some repairs. It suddenly started making a loud grinding noise. My car was very old, things were always going wrong, so I pulled into a shopping center parking lot and called my parents for advice on whether I should take it back to the shop or get a tow. I know very little about cars. My mom told me she would come and meet me at the shopping center and we'd figure it out. At this point, my phone battery was also dying, so my phone shut off after the call. As I was hanging out in the parking lot, a guy pulled over on the street in front of me, rolled down his window, and asked me for directions. I did my best to direct him, but instead of taking off, he then pulled into the parking lot and got out of his car. I found that a bit weird. It was broad daylight, I was in front of a shopping center, cars were driving by constantly, it's not like it was nighttime in an abandoned alley. So the guy started to make what seemed like small talk and I complied, still not understanding what he wanted. He introduced himself and asked what my name was and I offered my first name. He asked what I did, I said I was a student studying art. He asked where I went to school and I told him, he asked how old I was. He made a little more small talk and then I guess seeing that I was a bit more relaxed, he said he was a sculptor and that if I was interested in art, I would love the sculptures he had at his house. He said we would go there right now and look at them. Immediately that dull alarm in the back of my head got turned way way up. 
I was young and naive, but I knew enough to never ever get in a stranger's car and immediately felt very uncomfortable. Though he knew how old I was, I looked extremely young. I started to put two and two together. He was getting increasingly more insistent that I get in his car and go to his house. He reached for my arm and at that point everything is a blur. I yelled that I had to go and ran for my car into the nearest store. It was a tiny game store so there weren't really anywhere to hide, but I told the cashier about the guy and asked if I could wait in there until my mom showed up. The cashier assured me the man would not be let in the store and that he and his co-worker would keep an eye on me until the man was gone. I also asked them if I could use their phone to call my mom and let her know what was going on since mine had died. I kept watching the guy outside by my car, worried he would try to come in, but as soon as he saw me use the store's phone, he got in his car and took off. I wish the story ended there. The whole encounter really shook me up, but as I reflected on it, I realized, through the questions the man had asked, he had my first name and exact birth date by asking how old I was and getting my birthday. He also knew where I went to school, though thankfully it was several hours away from my hometown where I encountered the man. I asked a friend of mine what kind of info he could get based on what he had, and much to my distress, my friend showed me he was able to find out my full name, my phone number, and my home address with the info I had given the man. I felt like such an idiot. I had always been taught to be wary of strangers and not give them personal info, and I was baffled by how easy this guy had gotten personal info out of me just by pretending to have a casual conversation. Nothing happened for a few weeks and I started to stress less, and stopped thinking about the encounter, and stopped worrying about running into the man again. Then one early morning my cell phone rang, the number was restricted. I answered, there was heavy breathing on the phone, but no reply. I hung up. It happened again the next morning, this time a man answered, asking, what are you doing right now? I said I was trying to sleep. What are you wearing? I immediately hung up. The calls continued. The next time I picked up, I told him if he called again, I'd call the police. I got a few more calls from a restricted number after that but stopped answering, and eventually they stopped. I'm still not sure if the calls were from the man I met in the parking lot, but it seemed likely. It was just too much of a coincidence they started after that encounter. I spent a good year being afraid of that man. I still can't believe how foolish I was giving him info about myself so easily and it was an important lesson in how smooth and sneaky creeps can be and now I'm much more careful about what I say to strangers. I still don't know what he had planned if I had actually been foolish enough to get in his car, but I'm very glad I never found out. When I was 18, I worked in my college's residence building at the front desk and I think I almost got assaulted or murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel, so two and a half floors were hotel rooms and half of the third floor were student rooms. The whole building operated with the hotel swipe key system that was pretty outdated, and all the doors were powered by four AA batteries. If the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and reprogram the door. A dark haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working an overnight shift at around 1 or 2 am and said he left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the night. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted, hypothetically. Students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card and charged $2 to be returned when theirs is located. I gave him a new key for his room and asked if he was a student or hotel guest and he replied student. At this point, I should have checked our system to charge his account. But I was caught up doing administrative duties and forgot. I used to trust people way too easy at this job but quickly learned not. Later on the night, maybe around 3 or 4 am, he came to the desk again and said he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card and he said no, so I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I'd changed the batteries and I went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name and I told him, he didn't tell me his. I opened the room door manually with the master key and I told him I'd have to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay, I'll close it, and closed and deadbolted the door locked. Really weird, but I tried not to think about it. I had changed the batteries on plenty of other doors by this point, and some students were iffy about having their doors propped open for their room to be on display for anyone walking by. He also had a really thick accent and I thought he might be an international student since we had a lot of students from other countries where English was not their first language. I gave him the benefit of the doubt and thought maybe it was also just a language barrier issue. At this point though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room, saying his bed was broken and he needed me to take a look at it, there was something underneath it that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out a little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it. It and threw it under the bed. He said there was a leak under the fridge. He just kept trying to get me down on the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up in the morning to take a look at it if anything was broken. I had my back to him and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed. In the most steady, chilly manner, he said, Ella, it's okay, you can take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. 
I swatted his hand away and, trying to remain composure, said, no thanks, I need to keep them on, even though he was creeping me out. I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me, or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped toward the door to close it again and told me to keep it closed. I told him no, I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me and focus on getting out of there. He once again tried getting me to follow him into the bedroom, saying the bed was broken, and I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot any actual problem with his bed. This is when I realized that he had nothing in his room. No dishes in the kitchen, no shower curtain in the bathroom, no sheets in the bed, nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back to the international student theory, thinking he had just arrived today and hadn't got a chance to buy anything yet. But in the pit of my stomach, I knew something was wrong. I fiddled around with the door for a few more seconds before announcing that it was fixed and quickly gathered the door kit and left. Before I had reached the elevator, he came back out without his shoes on to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes and called out, Ella, the door isn't fixed, you need to come back. I went back and opened the door manually and told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got to the front desk, I checked the computer and saw that the room he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or a hotel room. I locked myself in our back office and called campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled at him to get on the other side and wait, now that I knew he wasn't a resident. He tore the corner off a slip of paper I had sitting on the desk and drew a flower on it, then put it back on top of my papers. When security arrived, he ran back up to the empty room and tried convincing them he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which I decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously he didn't, that's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. Security asked him for a student card and he couldn't produce it, so they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office and could immediately tell he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartments across the street and he said yes, but couldn't tell them what the building number was. He said his apartment number was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months ago later and apartment 1200 doesn't exist. When security asked what his purpose was to be sneaking into a room, he just kept up the ums and the uhs and saying he didn't know. They'd ask, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anybody who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? And he kept fidgeting and saying, I don't know, no reason, I was just here. At one point he tried to tell them he was my friend, at which point I poked my head out of the office to say that I literally had never seen him before that night. He left, we didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything anything, but it was still unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured out that the room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, a housekeeper came to the desk and told me they found the door dead bolted open, the TV on, and a housekeeper inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left for the night and when the creep let himself into the building, he found out. I never saw him again, and to this day, I still have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the creeps. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. The lesson I took from the story was always read through your lease slash rental agreement fully before signing. This takes place four years ago in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm originally from California, so trading up city life for a less urban life was very challenging for me. Making friends was hard, but I made the move to be with my dad who lived in an apartment complex with a roommate. My dad was a trucker, so he was gone for weeks at a time, while I was left alone to work and come home to a foreign place that I was slowly being accustomed to. My roommate was gone most of the time because he had a girlfriend, and he would leave his dog with me, so I never truly felt alone. I had an old lady for a neighbor that would come up and check on me too. That's how people were in that area, and I found it kinda nice to how people knew their neighbors. I got to know everyone in my building's name after about 6 months of living there, except one. There was a man, I'd say in his early to mid 50s, who lived directly below my apartment. He looked, for lack of better description, like a creep. He was balding except for on the sides of his head, which that hair was straggly too. He was tall and kinda skinny, had outdated 90s glasses, and a thick mustache. He was the only person in the building who wasn't friendly, or at least didn't make the effort to say hello or introduce himself to me. He also happened to be the maintenance man for all five buildings. I didn't think much of this at first. I honestly don't care if you're overly friendly to me. 
I enjoy having space of my own and sometimes being too friendly and suspicious to me. That's just a personal problem, but I'm explaining why I didn't send up any red flags at first. One day when I was pulling out of the driveway to go to work in the morning, I noticed across the large lawn that led to the door to our buildings, a maintenance man was standing in the center, staring directly at me. Stare is the wrong word, more like glare. At first, I looked around confused, thinking perhaps he was looking at someone or something behind me. I was the only one there. Although a bit creeped out, I shrugged it off and continued with my day, forgetting all about it. The next day I was over at my neighbor Claire's apartment, the elder lady, and she happened to bring up a maintenance issue she had. But she mentioned that she would never ask the maintenance man for anything, and neither should I. I tried to ask her more about what she meant by that, but she ended up being very broad and said something along the lines of, he's just a known creep around here. Fast forward to the first incident. It was around 2am and I was still awake, but only barely, sitting on the couch watching TV alone in the apartment. I was starting to drift off into sleep when I heard a soft noise near the front door. Thankfully, the show was very low in volume, because I normally don't pick up on quiet noises most of the time. I turned off the TV and began listening. Next to the living room on the right side is the patio area, and on the left is the kitchen and the front door. The light from the moon and outside lamps were flooding through the patio glass door, so I could see the doorknob to the front door moving, not just moving, but someone was using a key. In an instant, the door flung open and I was on my feet, with nowhere to hide at that point. I stood my ground and saw the silhouette step into the kitchen. That's when I saw it was the maintenance man. My stomach dropped and he stopped dead in his tracks when he spotted me, looking as if it was unexpected to find me awake. I noticed he had a large coat on, even though it wasn't winter or even cold that particular night. I noticed that only because the jacket looked bulky, as if he was carrying things in it that I couldn't see. What are you doing? Was all I managed to squeak out. I was shaking, my knees feeling like they were about to give out. For reference, I was a 22 year old woman standing a whopping 5 foot 4, with no way to defend myself at all from where I was standing. He looked shocked, which made me feel like I had gained a little power from the situation. He retorted confusedly and angrily with, Your toilet is making a loud noise that I could hear from my bedroom. I was angry and terrified, and only reacted with more anger when I saw him scrambling for excuses. So you just let yourself into my apartment at 2 in the morning? I'm reporting this to management first thing in the morning. He stepped closer to me then. I backed up a few steps but still stood my ground, quickly turning on the light closest to me so he could see my fury. The toilet is rumbling. I need to check it. Now. Now I was trembling so hard I could barely stand. I had adrenaline and anger and fear all coursing heavily through my body. Get out. He started to take the liberty to look around the kitchen where he was standing. My head immediately thought, what if he goes for a knife? And that's when he said it. I can come in whenever I want. The sentence makes me shiver to this day. I didn't know what to do and felt the power over the situation quickly dwindling down to a bad feeling that something bad was about to happen. If you don't get out of my apartment now, I'm gonna start screaming as loud as I can. My voice was crackling and shaky, which made my heart drop into my stomach. I immediately felt like I was gonna be sick when he took yet another step forward towards me. Check the lease. I could come in whenever I want. I'll see you later. He winked at me, creating a wave of nausea and I felt faint. He slowly turned around and walked out, closing the door behind him and even going far enough as to lock it from the outside with his extra key. The next day, I contacted management as soon as their office opened. I could tell the conversation wasn't going anywhere when the manager sounded irritated right off the bat. When I told her that the guy entered my apartment illegally, she cut me off and told me that they do not allow any illegal activity and take what I was saying very seriously. I thought, yes, I've got him. Until the manager said, you can't just throw around accusations without proof. This man has dedicated over 20 years to working for this company and we don't plan on getting rid of him anytime soon. Perhaps if you had read over your lease like you should have, yes, she was actually scolding me, you would have seen the clause that states that a maintenance worker has keys to the entire property. And if there is a maintenance issue, they are permitted to access the property at any time of day. This floored me. It couldn't possibly be legal. But of course, I'm from California and of course, I didn't read the lease carefully. When I moved there, my dad was already living in the apartment and I literally had nowhere else to go. So if I were to be living there, I was going to have to sign the lease no matter what. So I did. Needless to say, nothing got done. Fast forward again, a few days go by and I don't see Mr. Maintenance Freak, until I do. This time I'm pulling in after a long 10 hour shift at work. I haven't forgotten about the scary incident, but I have put it in the back of my mind for the time being to concentrate on other things, although I lost sleep over it. I park my car facing the large lawn area again and start using my phone for a few minutes. I'm peering down on my phone and glance up for a split second before I see him there. He's standing across the lawn staring angrily at me. I mean furious. I quickly look back down and pretend I have not seen him, getting that sinking feeling again. As a paranoid person, I put the key in the ignition just in case and pretended to keep scrolling on my phone while subtly locking my door. I glance up again and this time he's walking towards me, very fast. 
I look in my rearview mirror, hoping to see someone that he may be stomping angrily towards. And of course, no one else is there. It's nearly dark now, but when he gets about 10 to 15 feet away from the front of my car, I can hear him shouting something, but I can't make out what he's saying. Now I put my phone down and I'm watching him come right at me until he reaches my window and starts banging it all with his might and slams his body into the door. He's also fidgeting angrily with the handle, even though the doors are locked. My car doesn't have automatic locks, so I'm praying that all my doors are locked at this point. My hands are shaking so bad that I'm having trouble starting the car. When I finally do, I realize what he's saying, which was a repeated cycle of the following phrases. I'm going to get you. I told you I could come in whenever I want. You really want to take me on? I'll kill you. I peeled out of there so fast, not even knowing where to go. I drove to the next county over, found a motel, and stayed the night there. The next day, I took work off and went straight to the management's office. I told them exactly what happened, and no matter what I said, they didn't believe me. This maintenance man was apparently a gift to mankind or something. He was a monument to the company and they appreciated his 20 years of service and dedication to them over him risking someone's life with threats. Long story short, I lost it. I called her psychotic and ended up getting evicted. I reported all this to the police, but between the lack of evidence I had and his perfect record slash shining references from his employers that seemed to love him, the police said that there was nothing they could do to move forward at that point. My dad and I ended up finding a nice home about 10 minutes away from that place. I ended up inviting Claire, my older neighbor, to the new house a few months later. She told me there was a single woman in the apartment before the roommate and my dad had moved in there that also left in a hurry after something happened with the maintenance man taking photos of her walking to and from her apartment to her car. When she confronted him about it, he told her, I can do whatever I want. I guess in Kansas City, maintenance workers are considered gifts to mankind. Needless to say, it's been four years and I'm back in California. This happened when I was about 18 years old. I was big into running back then and lived in a town that was a suburb but had big swaths of farmland, as in smallish tomato and strawberry fields, not huge never ending wheat fields. I preferred running on the dirt at the edges of these fields because it was a lot easier on my legs than running long distances on concrete or asphalt, and I was using training for half marathons. This particular day I was planning to run an easy 6 miles. I told my mom as she suggested I do a loop and then meet them at the dog park about 3 miles from our house as my halfway point. This is pre cell phone area, but being careful I took a walkie talkie my dad always used and my mom took the other one. Now, the walkie talkie had a range longer than the ones my brothers and I played around with when we were younger, but it definitely did not work 3 miles away and I honestly had no idea what its exact range was. So I take off to my run, I'm planning to go on the sidewalk for a little bit until I get to the fields. I think it was lettuce or something then, but short small plants. I'm running in the dirt with the road a few yards to my left. I have to run south and then turn right onto a slightly smaller, less traveled road to get to the dog park. As I'm running on the first dirt part, my parents drive by and, being dorks, they hawk and wave and yell at me. I wave and then soon after I make my turn onto the smaller road. This one is road, me on flat dirt, small drainage ditch, forever of lettuce field, then a wall that is the backyard of some houses. I start noticing how quiet the street is and how few cars are passing me. Then I randomly start thinking to myself, if someone tried to do something, I could run to those houses. Then I hear a car, but this one doesn't pass me like all the others. I hear it slowed down so that it is behind me, just out of my peripheral vision. My senses go super alert and I immediately realize what an idiot I was to pick this route because I'm stuck out here with no one to help me and nowhere to hide. The car starts speeding up enough so that it's next to me and I glance over and see a man. Middle aged, white, dark hair, totally normal looking, but I get a chill down my spine immediately. He sort of leans over into the passenger seat and says in a super sweet voice, Hi, where are you going? Do you need a ride? I am scared and realize that this is not good. Immediately, nothing has happened yet and he could be totally innocent just wanting to chat, but my intuition is in overdrive telling me I'm not safe. I hop over the ditch thinking at least that will make it harder for his car to follow me if I need to take off across the field to try and make it to those houses in the distance. Well, this pisses him off. He guns it and gets closer to the ditch and in front of where I am and then he says in a voice I can only describe as bone chillingly evil, you know, you shouldn't be out here all alone. Something horrible could happen to you out here and no one would ever know where to find you. He put his car in park and is taking off his seatbelt when I remember the walkie talkie. Piece of junk is all static because I'm too far away, so I immediately turn down the volume and say loudly, hey dad, yeah, yeah I see your car, I'm over here by the spread Buick, do you see me? Fake wave to no one. There was no car coming from the direction my parents were and when I had started talking, there was no one behind us either. 
by the grace of the universe at that exact moment, a car turned onto the road. The guy saw it, looked at me, and sped off so fast he left skid marks. I have never run faster in my life, and I was looking behind me every few seconds and thought he'd be waiting for me at every intersection I had to cross. I was shaking and I was scared and relieved when I got to the dog park. I told my parents everything and my mom called the cops. They took a statement but said it would just help if something actually happened to someone else. The weird part was, I was having trouble getting my story out and I was so upset and before I gave a description of the car, the cop asked, was it a red Buick? He wouldn't tell us why, but that just added to my feeling that I had nearly escaped something awful. This was back in 2013 when I was living in New York City as a 23 year old. I was living with my best friend from college on the west side near Times Square in K-Town. I was going through some tough times back then as I was unemployed at the time. I had a lot of time so I would go on walks by myself to clear my head time to time. One night I was feeling exceptionally depressed so I decided to walk to K-Town to grab a drink by myself. I walked into a Korean bar and I got some weird looks from the waiter as I asked for a table by myself. After ordering a couple of soju bottles, I was feeling pretty drunk so I decided to walk back home. However, as I was exiting out of the bar, this Korean guy followed me. He looked very normal, just like a nice Korean guy. He told me that he saw me drinking at the bar by myself and that he would love to walk me home to make sure I got home safe. I politely declined, after all, my apartment was pretty close, but he insisted and he looked so harmless that I decided to take him up on his offer. We walked like 10 minutes I think and it was quite pleasant. We were both a little drunk, but I remember talking about all sorts of things, nothing personal. When we finally arrived at my apartment, I thanked him and wished him farewell. Now, my apartment was a 5 story walk up, and there was a main door where we needed a key to open to get to the building, no doorman. I didn't think much of it and inserted the key to open the door and went in. The door takes a while to close shut, and it was my mistake for not checking before I went up the stairs. While I was approaching the second floor, I heard someone grab the door from closing and I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. I literally got goosebumps all over my body, and I felt like I was in danger. As I started to pick up the pace, I heard the footsteps going faster up the stairs. I lived on the fifth floor, and I started to run up, clutching my keys in my hand. The guy started to run up the stairs as well, and I could literally hear him getting closer and closer to me. This all happened in a couple of seconds, but it felt very long. I finally got to my floor, and as I tried to open the door, I looked back and literally saw the guy's head on the staircase. I rushed to open the door and I managed to close the door right on his face. My heart was beating so fast and I didn't know what to do at that point. It was already 3am and my roommate was asleep. Luckily, he didn't knock or anything, so I decided to just go to my room and hope that he's gone home. Around 7am, my roommate woke me up. She said that there is a man standing in front of our apartment door. My heart sank and I explained the whole situation to her. She and I went to the door and screamed that we were going to call the police if he doesn't go home. I looked at the people and he told me that he would only go home if I gave him my number. We then called the police and saw him being escorted out. My roommate had to go to work, so she left the apartment and called me a few minutes later. She told me that she saw the guy speaking to the police downstairs. Apparently, he tried to lie to the officers that I'm his girlfriend and that we got into a fight. My roommate went up to them and explained to the officers that I do not have a boyfriend and that she doesn't know him at all. The police let him off with a warning. About two hours later, I heard a buzz from the main door downstairs. Maybe it's the police? Surely, it can't be him again, right? I answered the intercom and I was shook. It was him again. Just give me your number and I'll go away, he said. I warned him that I'm going to call the police again if he doesn't leave. A couple of minutes later, I heard ferocious knocks on my door. He must have gotten in when someone was entering the building. I was so scared at that point, so I immediately called the police. Unfortunately, the guy ran away before the police got there. The worst part about this experience was that my roommate and I were so scared to leave and come back to our apartment. I would have anxiety every time I come home, worried that I might see him in front of our apartment door. For about a week, the police escorted us when we felt scared. Bless them. I never saw him again, but it was one of the scariest moments of my life. So creepy stalker dude, let's not me. I live with my girlfriend as expats in a pretty foreigner friendly Asian country. Most of the time we get by just fine despite only knowing a little bit of the language because most people we interact with on a day to day basis speak fluent English. We started out in a tiny apartment which we quickly outgrew. We found a gorgeous condo with nice amenities and decided to move in. This condo is owned and managed by a local owner rather than by an association or company. The building is a little bit older, which means that instead of key card access to our door, it came with a traditional key lock inside and bar latch, which is nice because it's more durable than a chain. Of note, our original building also had key card access to our floor, meaning that we could only ever access our own floor. Even the emergency exit stairwells did not allow entry to floors other than our own. 
This new place did not include this measure, and I routinely enjoyed a walk up the 15 flights of stairs to the room as a bit of a warm up before going swimming. The quaint feeling of all of this changed about two months after we moved in. We were both starting new jobs and dragged our feet on some of the final touches of moving in into a place. That is the last time we ever do that. My girlfriend nudged me awake at about 3 in the morning. I wake up extra groggy and unsure of my surroundings, but I snapped to full attention when she whispered with wide eyes, someone is trying to open the door. Now, the condo is 100 square meters, and the main door and the bedroom are at opposite ends. The bedroom itself has a rather sturdy door that was closed, and the aircon runs at night, so this had to have been some sort of commotion for her to wake up. I sprung out of bed and made it to the door in seconds. There was some guy outside our door, studying very intently at our lock. He was about my height, though probably 15 kilos heavier, and he was not a foreigner like us. Wrong room, I had to yell, because the door is pretty thick. There was a pause and then a thud, then a smaller tock 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 as he was knocking. From experience, I know that it's hard to hear through the door, and if English was not his first language, then understanding me through the door was going to be a real challenge anyway. Looking through the people as he kept up steady knocking, I noticed he swayed back and forth slightly, so I figured he maybe had a couple drinks and had the wrong room. I turned to my girlfriend and told her so, and that I was going to open just the key lock but not the bar latch and tell him he had the wrong room. She didn't love the idea, but what was a good alternative? I took a deep breath and undid the key lock. My hand shook as I turned the handle, and one hand braced against the door while the other opened it slightly. He must have been leaning close because I saw his face right at the opening, and I could smell beer on his breath. You've got the wrong was what I got out before he pushed against the door as hard as he could. The bar latch held, but it was enough that my girlfriend threw herself against the door, and with our combined force we shut it again. No, I yelled, go away, wrong room. Then he muttered something that sent chills through me. The door muddled the noise, having just woken up played tricks on my ears, and the language barrier filled in the gaps. But I could swear I heard him laugh a little and say, stupid boy. I froze. My girlfriend turned the key lock as he slammed his body into the door once, twice, three times, I lost count. Every time I pressed against it harder, but I could still swear the four screws that held the bar latch in place wiggled slightly. The thuds returned, and looking through the people, I could see that he was punching the door. His stomach face looked patient and annoyed as he swung his arm back over and over each time it hit my girlfriend and I could feel the vibration through our entire bodies. After what felt like an eternity, the pounding stopped and I looked through the peephole. He wasn't there any longer. I listened closely and I could hear the long ding of the elevator down the hall. He might be leaving. My girlfriend had both our phones, texting the condo owner on hers and shoving mine at me. She was calling the owner, but at 3am there was no answer. Frantic text of, someone is trying to break in, spammed the other end when no one was picking up. She messaged friends of ours who live in the next building, but we both knew it'd be hours before anyone responded to us. We calmed down a bit and agreed that we were going to be up for the rest of the night, but that we'd settle up with the condo owner in the morning and report it to the building management. There were security cameras in the hallways, so they'd be able to follow up. Then I heard the elevator ding again. I was shaking as I returned to the peephole and watched as the chunky man returned. He was hanging up a mobile phone and he retrieved something from his pocket, a knife, a multi-tool, and that's when I said he's back and I grabbed the biggest kitchen knife within reach and reached to brace the door. My girlfriend was almost in a full blown panic as she grabbed the cast iron skillet. That's when I realized for the first time that there was a chance that someone was going to die. The door handle was wiggling as he started to poke at the lock with whatever was in his pocket. If he opened one lock, the only thing between him and us would be four tiny screws in the bar latch and if he got in this condo we were going to defend ourselves as best as we could and that's where i realized we were foreigners and dealing with manslaughter charges in a foreign court system would be an absolute nightmare or if we severely injured him and he was able to communicate his story his way to the police while we struggled with an interpreter and of course this is all assuming that we would be the ones to overpower and subdue him all this is running through my head as I called the equivalent of 911 and shouted English into the phone until someone spoke English. My brain wouldn't quiet down enough for me to be polite. I finally got an operator that spoke English and I explained someone was trying to break into our condo, that he had left and returned, and gave him the address. He sent a car and asked for an ETA and he couldn't give me one. He wandered off again but my spider sense was in full alert mode. It wasn't until half an hour later when several people wearing police uniforms and building management jumpsuits knocked on the door that I calmed down even a little. Still, I wasn't sure what to expect. One of the groups spoke English while the rest stood back. I explained everything in detail and pointed at the camera in our hallway, saying I wanted whoever it was found. One of the cops pointed at the nearby knife and raised an eyebrow, and I just confidently said, yeah, I would have if I needed to. After assurances and apologies and promises of follow up, we received what we should have collected weeks ago, direct phone numbers to our building security room where cameras are monitored as well as the local police station and the personal mobile number of our building security director. 
The sun was coming up and our condo owner called my girlfriend to comprehend what was going on. She promised us that she'd sent locksmiths there that day to install another deadbolt as well as a second bar lock if it helped us feel safe. The follow up of everything was that the guy was indeed someone who got drunk and mistook the room. It was on the wrong floor. His wife had to come collect him more than once and he would be fined for the cost of installing the extra locks. So while it is a bit comforting to know that he's a random drunk instead of a burglar, I still explain to building management that I have no desire for an apology from him. I don't care if he feels bad. Police reports here can be messy and locals can hold severe grudges that I did not want to deal with. I will only keep from a full police report if I literally never see or hear from him again. So just as some background, I am male and currently 25 and still living within 15 miles of my old house. This happened when I was about 8 or 9, making my sister at the time 5 or 6. We lived in a quiet neighborhood that, once I grew up, I found out was actually a lower income part of town. However, we had some wonderful neighbors and it was thanks to these neighbors that a lot of potentially negative situations were avoided. At the time, my dad was working an 8am to 8pm job and my mother was a secretary at a hospital, which meant that during the day she was often at work. Usually my sister and I had a babysitter, but once I reached about 8 or 9, I began to be old enough to look out for us without a babysitter. Now mind you, this was the 90s which certainly were not safe but were much safer than they are now. Also, we had the previously mentioned neighbors who generally did a good job of keeping an eye on us in our house. This particular incident was one of the first times I was charged to babysit for my sister. She was in her high chair eating whatever my mom had left for us when I got a knock on our front door. And this was strange since we never got visitors on a regular basis, other than the boy across the street who would want us to come out and play, but he usually just yelled my name while knocking. I was young and naive and decided to open the door. There was a locked screen door beyond that. I left that closed and locked. Outside was a middle-aged man. I hardly remember his facial features or even body type. I remember his yellow shirt and dirty jeans. Can I help you? I asked innocently. No alarm bells going off yet. Hey there, are your parents home? Alright, first alarm bell. My parents teaching me not to trust strangers rushed through my head, but I still didn't quite fully grasp of the potential danger here. My mom went to the store. She'll be back any minute. Weird half-lie. I could have said she was here but in the shower or that she was laying down upstairs. I'm glad I didn't tell him that she wouldn't be back for quite a few hours, but looking back it's scary how naive I was. Well that's no problem. Hey, so look, my dog went missing and I think it went into your backyard. Do you mind if I can come in and we can go check it out? Okay, so I might have been dumb, but I wasn't that dumb. There was no way I was letting this stranger into my house, especially with my sister there. She was my first thought. Sure, I didn't want to have any harm follow me, but she was my sister and it was my job to keep her safe. I should have closed the door right then and there, but once again I went with a less safe but still not totally stupid route. Well, the gate should be unlocked. If you want to go check the backyard, you can. And promptly closed the door. Now, of course I was very curious if there was a stray dog in my backyard. Dogs are great. Even with the weird guy being around, I was pretty interested to see how his search in the backyard went. So I decided to go check the back window and see if there was actually a dog and, if so, if the man would catch it. Now at this point, I am sure you have figured out that there was no dog, and when I looked out the back window, I could see almost the entire yard, including the gate. The man wasn't there. This was mere seconds after I had closed the door on him. I waited for a few minutes, but he never showed up. After about 5 minutes, there was another knock on my door. This time I was much more wary and I didn't like this guy showing up. I was pretty tired of the whole ordeal, but I still hadn't fully grasped the situation. I kept the chain lock on the door and cracked it open. Did you find your dog? Again, I can't remember his facial features, so I can't really recall his expression, but I remember his tone was a bit desperate as well as annoyed. No, I looked all over the yard and I couldn't find him. I have a picture in my car if you want to take it just in case you see him. Nope, no more. I still didn't understand abduction, but I certainly was not going to go anywhere outside of the house with a stranger. I told him that he can leave a picture in the mailbox and we will keep an eye out. Once again, promptly closing the door. What followed is what really creeps me out to this day. Looking back, I was freaked out that I had to come that close to exposing my sister and myself to danger, but this really scared me. Suddenly there was more knocking on my door, not the screen door separating the door, the door itself. Like I mentioned previously, the screen door was locked and unless that was open, it was impossible to knock on the door itself. It freaked me out and I took my sister to my bedroom and crept back out to the kitchen where I could see out onto the front yard and saw the man quickly getting back into his car while my saint of a next door neighbor Joan stood on her front lawn smoking and watching him intently. It took a long time for me to add it all up and honestly, I had forgotten about it for a long time. When I finally remembered it all, I couldn't even believe my own memories. Either way, Mr. Yellow Shirt Man, yeah, let's not ever meet again. Also, thank you Joan wherever you are. You saved me on multiple occasions and I didn't even know it.
When I was in fourth grade, my family was still living in Denver, Colorado in a small condo near my school. My brother, kindergartner at the time, and I only had to cross the street and walk between a couple of apartment buildings to get to the football field attached to our school. It was normally a pretty quick and safe trip to and from. My mother was taking night classes at NAU at the time, and her boyfriend, whom we lived with, would usually watch us in the evenings, although he wasn't off work until about 6.30pm. We grew up as latchkey kids, so this wasn't a big deal. One day, my brother and I were walking home together after school like we'd usually do and had just gotten to the street in front of our home when a white car pulled up in front of us. The man driving the car didn't seem like your typical weirdo, maybe in his late 20s and looking pretty clean cut. Looking back, the fact that he was driving such a fancy car, a Benz I believe, and wearing such a crisp outfit didn't really fit with our neighborhood. He asked my brother and I if our parents were home. I immediately got a serious sensation of stranger danger from this dude. I looked at our apartment across the street, then back at him, and in the most I'm not stupid tone I could find, I asked why. It doesn't matter, he replied dismissively. Are they home? He seemed a little more insistent with his question and glanced around. Yep, despite fully knowing they were not home and that my mom's boyfriend wouldn't be able to be there for another two plus hours. I figured it was better to lie and say yes. What are they doing, he asked, really looking us over. I then turned to my brother and ordered him, let's go, but he wouldn't follow me. I went to grab his hand and he quickly withdrew with a sharp no and looked back at the guy. The guy then looked at both of us and then back to my brother, and with a facial expression that made my hair stand on end, he said, come closer, I have something for you. My brother started walking to the door of the car and the guy was reaching with his hand out, nothing in it, like he was about to grab him. I grabbed my brother's coat immediately and started hauling him towards our apartment as fast as I could. He was screaming for me to let him go, but I was terrified so I just kept dragging him. The guy quickly put his car into gear and literally peeled out of there. My mother's friend started picking us up from school after that and a PSA was issued to the community. I still get a little creeped out when cars slow down near me while I'm outside walking. Potential child abductor, let's not meet again. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.